Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to my analysis of Elden Ring. Today we'll be covering Lyurnia, doing Rani's questline, and completing the Karian Academy. It took me a while to decide which area I would consider the second between Lyurnia and Kaelid, being that both feature several connection points to Limgrave and both feature NPC quests that require visiting the other area. And so I eventually landed on Lyurnia, mostly because the loot here is mostly Spithing Stone 2s and 3s, whereas Kaelid has more 4s and 5s. I would also assume that more players' first playthroughs involved exploring through Lyurnia second, perhaps after going through the trick chest to Kaelid, and assuming the rotting hellhole would be much more late game before returning to Limgrave. Now before I get to the actual contents of this video, I wanted to touch base on a couple of things I noticed in the comments of the last. One comment in particular told me that I shouldn't use the word objectively when presenting subjective information, and then proceeded to insult me like five times before saying that they appreciate my content and the effort it takes to make, but using the O word makes me look smug and my content off-putting kind of an insult sandwich, but whatever. Now I can only think of one real important moment I used the term in which I said that Elden Ring is objectively the best FromSoft game, a statement that I will absolutely say with my chest and can back up with a mountain of metrics to prove, but that would be a very dry and boring video. And I'm not even sure if that was the point the comment was referencing, considering it never mentioned a specific instance, nor anything to back up their statement. I can't think of a bigger waste of everyone's time than to write and or read a comment that's for one thing insulting, and also offers nothing substantive to back up a claim. Just say the nuh -uh meme and move on. At least that's funny. I don't really want to harp on this, but I absolutely use the word objectively very carefully and only in instances where I can fully stand behind it. I'm also pretty careful to understand when the things I enjoy are subjective, such as how I love playing Starfield an objectively terrible game that shouldn't cost $70. I can clearly see that my opinions have been skewed by the fact that I've never paid a cent for Starfield, because it's on Games Pass. And I cherry-picked the gameplay that I liked and ignored the rest, finding a pretty satisfying gameplay loop within the rest of the non-functional garbage. Now pivoting from all that, let's look at one of my favorite comments of all time, which read, Elden Ring has worse combat than Bloodborne has worse lore than DS1, worse bosses than DS3. It has an enormous world with a lot of filler. It literally has the same amount of enemy variation and bosses as a Dark Souls game stretched into this enormous world, making it empty and repetitive. You like this one the most, it's one thing, but objectively the best one? What's the parameter for that? Your tastes or your subjective opinions? Yeah, fuck this. Now this is one of the dumbest comments I've ever read but I have a lot of respect for the balls that this guy has to say it out loud and for offering me something to engage with within his claim. I replied, Yo, that take is crazy, lol. Bloodborne's combat is literally one of the worst in Soulsborne. The cripple mechanic makes almost every beast fight a joke, the parry system ranges from zero risk freebie shots to missing your shot for no reason, and you have to grind a resource just to attempt it. The trick weapons are incredibly basic and offer nothing to the combat except for overpowered combo moves that destroy every single boss if you use beast blood pellets. And you're comparing that to Elden Ring, a game with two extra jump moves added to every single weapon's move set, not to mention crouching moves, and situations where you can jump over bosses moves. There's also the improved double and triple parries, which are obviously more engaging than shooting a boss once from outside of the range of their attacks. Finally, there's a thousand different Ashes of War and spells to offer a variety of playstyles, which absolutely crushes the basic ass trick weapon system. DS1's lore is literally just a creation myth with dragons, and none of it makes any sense. You can like it more if you want, but fantasy nonsense certainly doesn't objectively compare well to a well-crafted story with many twists, turns, betrayals, and loyalties within the main ruling family's backstory. All of which was written by George R. R. Martin, who has like 50 years of experience writing political fantasy. Once again, your opinion doesn't mesh with reality. DS3 does have incredible bosses, and this is the only thing you've said that makes objective sense. However, the quality of DS3's bosses comes from its combat being incredibly basic. The only useful way to fight in DS3 is through simple dodge that attack combat, highlighted by having almost no parryable bosses. I love DS3, but it doesn't take many risks, whereas Elden Ring's combat and bosses offer triple jump, jumpable moves, ashes of war, spirit summons, and even horse combat. There is no real comparison. DS3 perfected an archaic system, Elden Ring evolved that system to an insanely higher degree. And yeah, maybe it has the same amount of enemy variation, but the mandatory content is rich with unique assets. Once again I say, you chose to play the optional content that would obviously reuse assets, and now you're complaining about seeing optional content. 
clearly you have no idea what objectively means because except for DS3, you've given the absolute worst examples to use in your comment and you clearly just like them. Elden Ring is objectively the best one, and if you watch the rest of the series, maybe you'll find out why instead of getting upset and writing a ridiculous comment followed by saying fuck this. And maybe saying all of this makes me sound smug and my content off-putting to some, but I'm not wrong. And comments like this highlight that better than I could ever describe. If Elden Ring isn't the best FromSoft game, then what is? And if you have an answer for that, now you have to defend it. Which is such an easy thing to take apart. DS1 is slow, tedious, and ugly. DS2 is much more of an RPG and loses a bit of the Dark Souls difficulty, and it's even uglier. Bloodborne focuses entirely on aesthetics, leaving boss quality behind. DS3 is refined, but its combat is limited. Sekiro is awesome and strayed from the Souls path so far that it's hard to compare, however, introduced jump attacks and deflections, which could be seen as the innovation which led to the triple parry system. All of these games are incredible in their own ways, and Elden Ring took so much from them to create FromSoft's greatest game yet which really shouldn't be a controversial statement at all. FromSoft has never had as many resources and as much experience as they have now. It should be assumed that their more recent work would be their best, just as the DLC they've worked on for two years will assumedly blow everything else away. And until From completely shits the bed and sells out, that will be the assumption I run with. To all those who are just here for Elden Ring content and don't care about the older games, I humbly apologize for that yep sesh. Know that I deeply appreciate every single one of the positive and engaging comments, which vastly outnumber the negative ones. And so, let's move on to Liernia. But first, do you have the strength and the courage to be free? Join the Helldivers. This video is not brought to you by Helldivers. In fact, it's probably brought to you at least a week late because I've been playing too much Helldivers. When I was first considering purchasing Helldivers, I thought to myself, man, I really don't have the time to get invested in a game right now, but uh, god damn, this game is fun. It's been a while since I've had a game suck me in this hard, and it's uh, pretty poor timing considering I'm trying to really pump this series out, but uh, I did however take an extra day off work a week for the time being to help finish this series leading up to the Elden Ring DLC release. But if you do have some time on your hands, then I do recommend this game. It is very addicting. I began where I ended the last video, standing above the lake with a Church of America to my left. Within the church, there's a somber-looking young mage who will ask for four quarters, before detailing how he was locked out of the Rhea Lucardia Academy and how you might be able to gain access yourself. He asks you to obtain his key, which is within the academy, and I said it a lot in the last video, so I'm going to try and only point it out once here. The NPCs are so useful if you're paying attention and exploring your surroundings to find them. Their dialogue is almost always referencing something that'll help you navigate this world with more ease, except for patches, but we'll address him later. Continuing further into the lake, you'll reach a mystical, magical swamp inhabited by these six-limbed mage creatures who contrast the more majestic scenery around them. Some cast wraith spells that will chase you around, and others ride undead horses patrolling the various bits of ruined architecture throughout the area. Pushing a bit further, you'll reach the Laskyar ruins, which has loot littered throughout, such as the recipe for freezing grease, as well as a ritual pot and some Trina lilies. However, entering these ruins will summon a revenant, a mage enemy with several diseased limbs grafted onto their body. They can summon portals in combat to create surprise attacks and spit pools of poison all around the battlefield. I'm pretty sure everyone hates them. At the far end of the ruins, you'll find a teleporter which will take you to the Rhea Lucaria main gate. However, your lack of the aforementioned key will prevent you from progressing. Luckily, there's a map leading you directly to one. Should be a walk in the park, so I'll return to it later. After returning to the Laskyar Ruins bonfire and progressing through, I arrived at a gazebo with a woman calling for help from within. She tells you that a bandit took her belongings and asks you to retrieve them for her, which will lead you to this shack with a man boiling prawn by it, called the Boil Prawn Shack. Wonder why it's called that. His name is Blackguard, and he offers to sell you the necklace he had stolen from the woman for a thousand runes. A thousand runes? You can get that by farming deers or something. Why is Liernia so full of broke boys? Anyway, he'll offer to sell you boiled prawn, which based on his armor set and the knowledge that seafood was once considered unfit for the average citizen's consumption and was therefore often fed to prisoners, you can assume that he's an escaped convict, a notion that will become apparent within the loathsome Dung Eater's quest. You can take the necklace back to the woman who will introduce herself as Raya and will give you a letter of introduction meant to take you to the Volcano Manor. A short stroll away from this gazebo, you'll find this bird's eye telescope. 
which can give you some bearings as to your surroundings, but also offers you a chance to appreciate just how massive and visually impressive Elden Ring really is. It's a pretty ballsy move to give players the opportunity to scope out this many assets in tandem, especially when most of them are simple PNGs cropped into the skybox from this position, which is all the more admirable when considering that you wouldn't even really be thinking that if I hadn't pointed it out. You can see the whole path you took to get here, as well as scout out many other potential useful routes you might want to take on your way to the larger points of interest in the area. Returning to the ground, there's a nearby bonfire aptly named the Scenic Isle Site of Grace, which Patches is camping next to. He opens up his vendor inventory for you, and if you talk to him, he'll offer you information on a strange bit of utility within the Abductor Virgin enemy's design. He tells you that certain virgins are bestowed with teleportation magic, and will bring you somewhere new if you get taken by their grab move. Specifically, he mentions that they'll spit you out at the foot of the Erd Tree, which would be quite the shortcut and might have gotten your attention. He continues, saying there happens to be an abductor virgin just below the Rhea Lucaria Academy's water wheel. And to skip forward in time, let's check this information out. After riding down the water wheel, dropping to the arena below, and finding the perfect timing to be hit by the grab attack, you die. The grab move was enough damage to kill me, and I think it kills you no matter what, dropping your runes at the bottom of Rhea Lucaria. However, you do end up getting transported to a lava-filled hellscape called the Volcano Manor. Not exactly the foot of the Erd Tree, but you really should have expected that unless this is your first FromSoft game. Surviving the gauntlet of lava and bats will eventually lead you to a site of grace, which resting at will allow you to fast travel once more, potentially to retrieve your runes, but continuing on this path will have you come face to face with this double abductor virgin fight. This fight is pretty bad, being that a single iron virgin is a pretty straightforward fight, which doesn't do all that much except for dashing attacks in the case of the wheel virgin and spinning attacks for the sickle one. They don't really complement each other well, and the standard issues that come with a gank fight are absolutely present here. Powerful Ashes of War spells come in handy for safely damaging them, but also reduce this fight to an unengaging mess. You'll get the Inquisitor's Grandiole weapon for beating this fight, but the real reward for taking this path is that it will grant you entrance to the Altus Plateau being one of three ways to get here. In a way, Patches wasn't lying when he said it would take you to the foot of the Erd Tree. You just never considered how big the tree's feet might be. And once again, this is an instance of Patches giving you true information, leading you down a potentially useful false path. Returning to Patches in Liernia, there's a nighttime fight with a Deathbird, which I mentioned in the last video as the one that drops the Red Feathered Branch Sword, and the one which I cheese with arrows in my no-hit run. This time, however, I would attempt to fight him more appropriately and would engage with his moveset. Unfortunately, I found that the many poorly telegraphed quick swipe attacks would make the experience quite frustrating, and that finding yourself too close to it after an opening would leave you vulnerable to the Death Blight Screech attack which does very little damage, but damage is damage, and I'd like to avoid it. The whole fight will have you favoring disengagement, only entering when you see a clear opening, and then spacing yourself from the majority of its moveset, which at least gives me some comfort considering that I've cheesed him so many times. Wasn't really missing out gameplay-wise. Maybe I'll try using Torrent on the next one of these fights? Progressing a little further, and you'll come across this encampment of Fire Monk Cultus, which contains a prayer book of their incantations. Along with the Ever Jail just further ahead, which will reward you with the Flame of the Fell God, this is another early game's subtle introduction to a more grandiose concept further into the game, this time referencing the Outer God which controls fire. Speaking of the upcoming Ever Jail, this fight with Aiden Thief of Fire is pretty trash. It's a simple PvP style fight with a Pyromancer character who wields a flail. Oddly enough, this boss isn't parryable as far as I'm aware, or I'm just shit at the game. Either way, unless you like gameplay that involves trading blows, this fight doesn't offer much. The Flame of the Fell God incantation is a cool legendary reward that sets up a fight further in the game, but I've never gone out of my way to clear this ever jail. Crossing to the other side of Liernia, you'll find this set piece with a loot carriage sitting at the end of his broken bridge back to Limgrave. A lone troll aimlessly wanders around the area, giving a somber, dilapidated tone to this piece of the world. The carriage contains the tree spear weapon, another part of the Erd Tree weapon set. Continuing, you'll soon see this magical defense system for Liernia a balloon meant to deploy mannequin soldiers which can be shot down for a golden rune. The mannequins have already been deployed here, so using environmental clues you'll be able to assume what happens when popping balloons further into the lake. After that I came across the purified ruins which contains a hidden basement revealed after breaking wooden planks which concealed it, the contents of which include a talisman that will increase your faith by five and a spare shabriri grape. After exploring the area a bit further you'll find the usage for that grape. 
jamming it into this blind undead lady's mouth. Progressing on this path, you'll find the Highway Lookout Tower, which is swarming with summoned ghost soldiers and glintstone projectiles. It's like a warm-up for the Karian Manor. At the top, you'll find the glintstone mage that had been casting Comet upon your approach, and you'll be able to loot a Karian Glintblade Staff, which boosts Glintblade sorceries. Past the tower, I came across another basic Tipia Mariner. And again, being a summoning necromancer with a teleportation ability, doesn't fight all that well on its own. These things are barely bosses, but can be worth hunting down to collect the death root they drop for Garank. This particular mariner also drops the Skeletal Bandit Spirit Summoning Ashes. Now throughout this fight, you might hear shouting for help in the distance, and upon locating the source, you'll see that Alexander has once again found himself humorously stuck in a hole in the ground. I should mention that he won't be here until you've defeated Radon and talked to him within the Wailing Dunes, which I had to complete early considering he had to be beaten to finish Ronnie's quest, and it wouldn't have felt like I completed an episode on Liurnia without clearing her quest and the Moonlight Altar which then also had me completing Deep Root Depths, and therefore Fia's and Dee's quests, including the Lich Dragon Fortisax, and more importantly, the fucking double gargoyle fight. So buckle up, buckaroos, because we're covering a lot of content in this one. Anyway, Alexander asks you to whack him out the hole once more, but stops you after the second hit, as he fears he may be shattered. He ponders about how a homie might be made more slippery and able to slide out smoothly. If only there was a way to oil your boy up. Luckily, I had purchased the oil pot recipe from the merchant in Safria, and was able to hit Alexander with it before whacking him once again and finally freeing him. I ask you, what other game allows you to oil up your homie before spanking his ass and having him thank you for it by offering you his meat? Alexander mentions he was wishing to gaze upon his home he vowed to never return to from these cliffs before venturing towards Mount Gelmir to temper himself in the flames of the mountain. By following his hint, you can fall down the side of this cliff to visit Alexander's home, a quaint little village of potmen called Jarberg. Here you'll meet this little pot boy named Jarbaron, who will ask you to be their village's new potentate. He tells you that you need to have soft hands for the position, and then says with your crusty ass hands, it's over for you. After reloading the area, he'll tell you that you're allowed to pick the various alchemical flowers within the village, which is great because I had already grabbed most of them, along with several ritual pots and cracked pots. Reload and talk several more times, and I'll talk about Alexander, poachers who hunt the pots for their alchemical properties, and his dreams to become a warrior jar just like his uncle Alexander. Exploring a bit further towards the lake, and you'll find a fight with the Knight's Calvary near the Gatetown Bridge site of Grace. I decided to learn a bit about parrying the Calvary for this fight, which went somewhat well. I would have liked for his horse jump slice to be parryable, but as far as I'm aware, it's not, which makes sense animation-wise. This disqualification of the one singular, easily telegraphed, and frequently used move meant that I have to engage with the rest of his moveset, which includes an unparryable horse shoulder check with little telegraph, spliced into similar combos as his quick slice attack. If I took the time to learn it well, I feel as though I could learn the parry timing of the quick slice, but I wasn't ready to invest that much time yet, so I eventually landed on his heavy delayed slash as my main source of parries. Once he hits the deck, the fight becomes very easy to control with little experience, mainly because this boss becomes backstabbable. If you temper your nerves, you can stick close to the knight, dodge its simple one-hit attacks, and land the backstab. However, you have to be constantly aware to stay close to the boss so as to backstab him out of his horse summon animation every time you see it. With these rules to guide you, this fight becomes embarrassingly easy. It's kind of a shame that there's no cavalry less Knight's Cavalry with a more expansive moveset. I will also note that someone in the comment section of the last video mentioned these fights are much more engaging when on Torrent. I will have to attempt this in a subsequent video, but for now I will say that this might be a fun option for a higher health build. Mm. But my intuition says that this method would require trading hits, something I'm clearly not built for on this run. The Gate Town site of Grace is also the next location of Hayeta, who once again asks for a Shabriri Grape, which can be looted off of the invader Edgar the Revenger on the other side of the lake. Kind of fucked up that you're feeding her the eyeballs of her father, but you also get the opportunity to then reveal to her that the grapes she's been eating are really people's eyeballs. Honestly, she takes that information like a champ. Further ahead, you'll find the artist's shack containing one of the painting puzzles, which require you to know different aspects of the area to pinpoint exactly where this painting had been painted and to get there. This one directs you to an area behind Karia Manor and rewards you with the Juvenile Scholar Armor Set and a Larval Tear. Now, the next direction I headed was supposed to bring me to the Karian Study Hall, an area I am fairly familiar with and have completed many times in my attempts to all remembrance no-hit the game. However, I took a left instead of a right here, 
and was met with a small set piece I had never seen before, which was this elevator being guarded by a guardian golem. Now I'm not exactly sure how I had missed this area, whether it be from ordinarily approaching the study hall from the lake, or from always gaining access to Bellum Highway through the academy main gate path, but I had never seen this golem, or this elevator before in my life. I easily played this game a hundred times over in no hit runs, new game pluses, challenge runs, and co-op runs, and I've never once taken this elevator. Nor have I explored the underground section that lies at the bottom, which I would learn is the lower side of the Einzel River that's explored in the last few steps of Ronnie's questline. It absolutely amazes me that a section of the game this massive would elude me for so long, especially considering how early game you have access to it. Within my first playthrough, I had spent quite a long time exploring and clearing the early game areas before I got to Radon, no hit him, and then went a bit viral on TikTok using the footage of it. From there, I began streaming and focusing my time and effort on the more important fights in the game, leaving many of the late game minor dungeons and areas unexplored until much later when I returned to them. Never would I have expected that a huge underground area had flown completely under my radar, and the discovery of this area gifted me such a valuable and poignant reminder of what Elden Ring was like to explore through on day one. The jolt of excitement I felt in the realization that I was treading on new ground, that there were now new options for me to find potentially useful items and powerful enemies within, is the exact reason that Elden Ring elevated the Souls formula to new heights. The world's worth of content that you can potentially skip if you were to focus on boss rushing leaves a plethora of unique assets, interesting weapons, beautiful scenery, lore content, Text, crafting recipes, upgrade resources, vendors, NPCs, and countless other valuable assets to explore through. And in my ignorance of this single world set piece, I had inadvertently saved this moment of discovery for two years and found it in the most appropriate time possible in the making of this video. Now playing alongside the homie I Booty Juice, at some point I had heard him in the process of fighting an Ice Dragonkin soldier, which I meant to find the location of but had never looked into it. Lo and behold, I happened to stumble into this fight while exploring Lower Einzel, the Dragonkin soldier of Noxtel. In phase one, he fights identically to the Dragonkin soldier in Sofria River, which is great because I lost that footage and now I have the opportunity to talk about it. The Dragonkins are some of the best designed large beast fights that FromSoft has ever created. They've thoughtfully been crafted to attack with melee moves which reach just into the spacing you'll create to keep the Dragonkin fully within frame while fighting it. This eliminates issues that are created when fighting a beast that towers over the camera when attacking their openings, such as Amygdala in Bloodborne or Seath in DS1, and also offers creative solutions when taking into consideration positioning. After fully learning the total moveset of Dragonkin, you can push into initial attacks, knowing that the secondary delayed attack will miss you if you target a specific leg. You will, however, have to learn the follow-up proximity punishes, such as his elbow slam followed by a ground shatter AoE, which is a jumpable move, or his spinning arm sweep, which cleverly positions the boss facing you at the optimal spacing once more. Dragonkins also have a bonus damage increase when attacking their heads, about 25%, which leaves you with several paths to take to defeat the boss efficiently. You can attack the head, which means dealing with more direct moves and combos, or attack the legs, which means dealing with proximity punishes. The Dragonkins also have a very subtle move that gets added to their moveset around half health that starts with a roar and then is followed by a multi-hit charge attack. The subtlety of its inclusion will likely throw you for a loop for a while till you've seen it enough. The real phase 2 of this particular Dragonkin begins with an ice imbued lightning AoE attack in which the Dragonkin unfurls its ragged wings and adds a large degree of mobility to its moveset. Its standard slams now deal lightning damage and build frostbite and a series of new ice lightning moves are introduced, such as the field spanning lightning bolt attacks and the flying slam. Overall, the dragonkins are very rewarding to learn. They offer engaging gameplay within a spectacle of fight and generally offer some pretty cool rewards. They're used sparingly enough to almost always be worth attempting, and this one in particular offers a very balanced fight that is appropriate for this point in the game, removes torrent for added difficulty over the last, and isn't sitting in a lake of scarlet rot. Your rewards for this fight include an achievement, the Frozen Lightning Spear Incantation, and a Great Ghost Glove Wart. Another unique facet of Lower Einzel is this cavern opening which gives a unique perspective overlooking the Lake of Rot. Here you can see the large vein of glintstone that Rayo Lucaria Academy sits upon, something that I hadn't noticed once while on the ground level of the lake. There's also a merchant in this area selling some recipes and the prisoner's armor set. And there's a Kakunda Stell which you can kill here to remove the threat when you return to this area in Upper Einzel to retrieve the wing of a stealth weapon. Finding this area was such a gift to me. 
and reassured me of the immense value of the explorative factors of Elden Ring. I'm sorry, but you would have to lack object permanence to call a world like this empty and repetitive, such as the comment I mentioned at the beginning of this video did. If you think of the exploration of the lands between as just a series of catacombs with Erdtree burial watchdogs at the end, then you've missed or forgotten so much of this world. Anyway, back to the overworld, I finally made it to the Karian study hall. The entrance features a pedestal that something can be placed upon, but for now we proceed up the elevator to the main chamber. You'll be met with a Proceptor who summons ghost soldiers, the defeat of which will only apply to the non-inverted version of the study hall. There's various pieces of loot, but otherwise the hall is a dead end, which you'll have to return to later. Moving on to the next point of interest on the map, we have the Church of Vows, which features everyone's favorite papal tortoise, who will accept every spell and incantation book to expand his vendor inventory. There's also a nighttime fight with another bell-bearing hunter who drops the meat peddler's bell-bearing. This church is ripe with lore to learn about if you talk to the turtle enough to reveal it. He explains that this was the church where Radagon and Renala were wed, and tells you about their nasty divorce which left Renala heartbroken. You can also pick up the golden needle and tailoring kit in a chest here, and use celestial dew items at the statue at the center of the church to remove the aggression of friendly NPCs you might have punched for calling you maidenless. Further down this path, you can see two more walking mausoleums which have a jumping slam attack added to their moveset. I would return to these mausoleums after beating more Remembrance bosses as they stay grounded once defeated, but none of the bosses I had beaten were available within these particular mausoleums inventories. There's also another Erdtree Avatar boss fight just nearby, which drops some very powerful elemental crystal tiers that could elevate your build in pretty significant ways when running elemental damage. Paired with the matching Scorpion charm, and you're looking at a 40% increase to your damage in either magic, lightning, or holy. Unfortunately for me, I missed out on the chance to obtain the magic scorpion charm due to finishing Ronnie's quest before finishing Selvis's, and now he's a puppet. This is unfortunate, being that I themed my build around a gradual increase in magic elements the further I progressed in Lyurnia, and the more magic-related items and weapons I gathered. However, I've cleared Lyurnia now, so it shouldn't be a problem going forward. Although, the holy tier will certainly come in handy against deathbirds, and the lightning will as well when I get to Altus and theme my build gradually around lightning. I feel the need to once again mention how well-rounded these fights are, and while they don't stray too far from the standard Souls gameplay, they are definitely rewarding to learn and offer a large pool of loot amongst the collective of them. Now returning to explore the more central area of the lake, we begin from the Gate Town Bridge site of Grace and enter Gate Town itself an area swarming with grey Shrek people. Here we'll find the first instance of Dialos outside of the Round Table Hold. He's standing over the body of his servant, Lanya, who was murdered by the Recusants, and vows to avenge her before saying the tale of House Hoslo is told in blood. Tough words from a man with soft hands. Anyway, just a bit further into Gate Town and you'll come across a nighttime fight with the first Deathrite Bird. If the Death Birds themselves didn't have me convinced that they're annoying and pretty poorly designed, especially for melee users, then the Deathrite Birds would be the nail in that coffin. The pools of ice fire left behind on their slam attacks makes damaging them at all a dangerous task especially when certain attacks seem to spread the pool of fire in a wide, often unpredictable area. It figures that the Death's Poker weapon is widely considered the most powerful weapon in the whole game, with its insane Ash of War that makes short work of any frostbiteable boss when it's based on the attacks of this sloppy monstrosity. At the end of the day, the lessons I learned when attempting to legitimately fight the Death Birds stands true when fighting the Death Right Birds. There are plenty of powerful ranged Ash of Wars and spells, and if you're not looking to trade hits with these big bird bitches, then you should absolutely take advantage of them. At the end of the day, mages get such a bad rap because of a single build. That obviously being the Azure Comet, Terra Magica, and Infinite FP Crystal Tier Cheese build. However, in most cases, Elden Ring offers bosses that are so aggressive and over the top that magic rarely gives you much of a benefit. Don't believe me? Then try to beat Godfrey on an unleveled astrologer where you get six casts of Glintstone Ice Crag before needing to hit the Chug Jug, which Godfrey only gives two potential openings large enough to safely use your Cerulean Flask. Challenge runs and pushing your limits is great and all, but at the end of the day, knowledge about the enemy you're facing is just as important as game skill, and in several fights later on in this episode, I'll point out how strictly sticking to melee builds can be misguided against fights that encourage a more medium ranged style of gameplay. The next mausoleum you'll find will be in this area guarded by headless spirit summoned soldiers and requires getting on top of to bring down. By exploring your surroundings, you'll find this spirit spring, which when timed correctly can land you on top of the mausoleum to break its skull growths. I greatly appreciate the variations available for this simple mechanic of duplicating remembrances, 
which in another timeline could have otherwise been an item to loot and turn in, such as the Lost Ashes item. Instead, we have puzzle minigames, which fill large areas with a grand magical fantasy concept, and is ignorable if you're uninterested in them or gaining more runes or boss weapons. I would say the same of the rises, such as the one in the next area, which is surrounded by the mannequin balloons. However, this rise uses the same function as the one in the Weeping Peninsula, which is the Seek Three Turtles minigame, this time not even having an invisible one. Kind of disappointing, but this is still a very early game location, and others offer more engaging and less time-consuming puzzles. Following your way through the nearby ravine and up the side of the pathway, you'll eventually reach the Bellum Church, which Hayeta now resides in. She tells you that she likes eating eyeballs now, and wants the finest eyeball in all the land, a legendary fingerprint eyeball from none other than the failed Elden Lord, Festering Fingerprint Vike. In order to reach him, we'll have to find our way through the frenzy-infused path of the mountain here, but first I'll clear the lower area of Bellum Highway. By first progressing Box questline at this bonfire just past the Academy Warp Gate, by speaking to Melanie here. She asks you to speak to your seamster, as his loyalty to you leaves him quite eager to engage with his only friend. This is a pretty powerful interaction if you ask me, as Melina is presumably an Empyrean and has no one to impress by looking out for the well-being of a lowly demi-human. This leads me to believe that she is purely altruistic, and I would love to hear more about her backstory in an effort to understand how she ended up in the position she is now, especially contrasted against the other Empyreans such as Rani, who get a lot of charity towards their character being that their goals are often quite grand, however, often fail to consider people on the ground level. Rani devised a plan to slaughter her half-brother Godwin, and in the process created those who live in death, a faction that is hunted for their blasphemy against the Golden Order. Millennia devastated Kaelid, presumably in a misguided effort to rescue Mikola, and left those who live there to suffer the consequences. And in contrast, Melina took the time to offer you advice to console your unlikely demi-human friend, and that simple notion developed so much intrigue and depth to her character. She has no great vision for this world, she only offers the opportunity for you, a Tarnished, to make the necessary changes to the Elden Ring so that a better, or potentially worse, outcome can come to be. But at the end of the day, whatever her motivations B, she leaves it in your hands. Anyway, you then have the opportunity to give Bach a golden needle, which will allow him to make alterations on boss armors and elevate his seamster skills. He once again cannot believe that you would be so kind to him. Within this same area, there's another Knight's Cavalry, which I used the same strategy as before, which was very effective at reducing this boss to a simple knight enemy with limited AI and a huge weakness to backstabs. I can't say how glad I am to have an effective answer for these guys after dreading them for so long now that I have a pretty good idea which moves are reliably parryable and which are not. They don't often drop anything I would want, and therefore I've pretty much avoided them throughout all of my playthroughs, or had a high health build that could trade hits, or cheesed the one in Kaelid which drops Bloodhound Step, which I try to avoid using unless I specifically need it to survive a challenge run. Also, after looking it up on the wiki, apparently the horse jump attack is parryable, so I'll have to figure out the timing and positioning on that one. This knight's cavalry drops the giant hunt Ash of War and a Knight Rider Glaive. Now progressing further in this area, past an encampment of soldiers guarding the Grand Lifted Dectus, you'll attempt to ride up this hill before being overcome by a shining flame at the top of a nearby tower. Being within line of sight of this knockoff Eye of Sauron will deal burning damage and will build the Frenzy status effect. However, you can safely avoid the influence of the flame by hiding behind cover and timing your movements with its cooldown. You'll find the source of the threat at the top of this tower in the form of these frenzied occultists who are channeling the flame, which will only cease once they've all been defeated. Past the tower, there's a pretty convoluted rise, which can only be completed after we've visited Rhea Lucaria, so we'll have to return here later. But in the opposite direction, more on theme for this area, we come across another frenzied flame afflicted village, inhabited by a handful of basic enemies with frenzy attacks thrown into their moveset. Here you'll be able to loot a note which will tell you of the location of the Three Fingers, the Lord of Frenzied Flame, who resides below the capital, Lyandell. You'll also be able to pick up the Shabriri's Woe Talisman which can be useful when comboed with your Mimic Tier Spirit Summon by summoning the Mimic while the Talisman is equipped and then removing it, which should make enemies prioritize aggroing on your summon instead of you. After clearing the village, you'll be met with this scene. The Church of Inhibition sits at the peak of this ascent with a ghost kneeling nearby, who can be spoken with to reveal his lamentations that Vike failed to take the throne and successfully bring chaos to the world. He'll continue a short ways towards the Church of Inhibition before festering fingerprint Vike invades and attempts to halt your progress. Though hard to tell while in the heat of combat, his armor is melted and disformed, imprinted by the fingerprints of the Three Fingers Embrace 
With information given to us later on, we learn that he sought out the Three Fingers to inherit the Frenzied Flame so as to save his maiden from fulfilling her purpose and sacrificing herself to burn away the Thorns of the Erd Tree. The same path that's given to us is an option to take on our ascent to Elden Lord. However, in Vyke's case, it can be assumed that his failure to remove his armor and therefore failure to fully embrace the Three Fingers caused the Frenzied Flame to tear his mind apart and prevented him from ever becoming an Elden Lord. And now his raving invasion form guards the Church of inhibition from those who might trespass on its grounds, and see what became of the maiden he sacrificed everything to save. She lays here dead with later information teaching us of the betrayal she felt in Vyke robbing her of her purpose, and almost plunging the world into chaos in the process. This whole area is a beautiful example of environmental storytelling and offers those invested in the world building and lore of the lands between many small story-based rewards, and grants us a warning as to the path we might be treading if we're following in Vyke's footsteps. Speaking of which, he drops his spear as well as the fingerprint grape that Hayata had been searching for. She gobbles it up and thanks you, presumably feeling the influence of the Three Fingers much greater now, as she'll soon find herself below Leyen Dell. Now to cover the farther west side of the lake, starting with the Albaneric village underneath the Moonlight Altar in this swampy area. Here we'll find the Feli Lu, discouraged at the fact that this village has been raised, which reminds her of unfortunate events within her past. We can progress further inside the village to see an illusionary pot which conceals a pleading Albaneric, who barely managed to escape the invaders with the hidden treasure of the village, half of a secret Halig Tree medallion. Realizing you're not aligned with those who had destroyed this place in search of the medallion piece which would lead to Mikola's Halig Tree, a sanctuary for those forsaken by the Erd Tree, he entrusts the treasure to you, in hopes you'll keep it from the curse mongers. The boss of this area is an Omen Killer, a rework of the Capra Demon, which in this case is flanked by several dogs. And if that doesn't give you DS1 PTSD flashbacks, then your nerves are more steeled than I. Fortunately, Elden Ring offers an assortment of tools at your disposal to manipulate enemies to your liking, such as stealth to avoid triggering the boss, and many effective ranged spells in Ashes of War. After taking out the much more present danger that is the nightmarish Souls Dogs, you'll be left with just the Omen Killer, who fights almost exactly like Capra, but with a flame breath attack and a multi-hit slam move. This enemy is balanced further in favor of the player by offering a backstab that at least somewhat trivializes the fight, but offers an easy early game battle that will reward you with a Crucible Knot Talisman. After obtaining half of the Halic Tree Medallion, your next visit to the Round Table Hold will be interrupted by an invasion with Ensha of the Royal Romains, who will attempt to kill you and take the medallion half for himself. After his defeat, you'll obtain the Clinging Bone weapon and be reloaded into the proper Round Table. By heading to Gideon, you can loot Ensha's armor set and then confront him about the attack. Being his master, he'll take responsibility for Ensha's actions and apologize that you were attacked within the grounds he explained were peaceful in your prior interactions. And with the piece of the Halig Tree medallion in your inventory, he'll offer you advice as to how you might be able to learn the location of the other half in the form of mentioning an Albanoric woman at the end of a cave in Liurnia. You'll also be able to speak with him about Nefeli, who he had disowned for harboring suspicions about him, as well as mentioning that he no longer had use for her. You can find her in a state of shock, sitting on the lower level of the hold, and talking to her will reveal that Gideon was behind the attack on the Albanorics. She's left in a state of demoralization after confronting her father figure about his actions and being disowned for it, which leaves the rest of her quest as an effort to get her back onto her feet. Kinda buzzkill, honestly, might skip this one. North of the Albanoric village, you'll find a rise with no seal nor elevator leading you to your prize, and so you'll eventually come to the conclusion that you can climb the rubble with Torrent to gain access to the top floor containing a memory stone. This is a cool play on the concept of a rise. Nothing crazy, but requires you to think outside of the box of assuming the puzzle would be an artificial design, and instead ascend the tower in the most simple and literal way, Occam's Razor style. Nearby is another Erd Tree avatar, which drops some pretty trash crystal tears, so it's easy to skip. I did, however, want to touch on how cool it is to learn that one of these bosses and a new set of Crystal Tears will be positioned at just about every single minor Erd Tree on the map, which means you'll be able to hunt them down easily after obtaining the map item to see where the minor Erd Trees are located. I would say the same of the Ever Jails also being visible on the map, and overall the map fragment system, along with bonfire warps being accessible from the simple to understand and visually forward map system, adds a lot to the exploratory facets of Elden Ring. 
It's an easy thing to overlook, but when previous games warp systems were based on menus and bonfire thumbnails, it highlights what a welcomed innovation Elden Ring's upgraded version is, and the fact that you've probably taken it for granted until now shows just how intuitive the design is. It's not exactly a grandiose change to the formula, but it's at least worth pointing out. The next location I visited would be the Rose Church, a church filled with bloody pustules and rose bushes which summons a sanguine noble upon entering. White Mask Vare has moved locations to just outside the church, and offers you the next step in his quest which involves invading with his gift of five festering fingers. Generally I play in offline mode almost entirely so that Fia's champions spawn as the standard predictable offline variants. However, Vare's quest requires you to use the invasion system to PvP with other players. At least, it used to require being online. In preparation for the DLC, which will require beating Moog to access, FromSoft has recently updated the game, adding an alternate offline way to complete Bear's quest, which involves using this red summon sign placed in the Altus Plateau. And since Patches was kind enough to show us a convenient path to the Altus Plateau, we can use this summon sign three times to progress his quest. You don't even have to win the battle. In fact, you can use the sign and then sever out three times if that's quicker, but after three invasions, you can return to Bear for the next step, which involves staining a cloth in Maiden's Blood, which will require progressing a bit further in Liurnia by first passing through Temple Quarter and grabbing the Ice Rind Hatchet along the way, a weapon that features an intrinsic Ash of War, Hoarfrost Stomp, which was extremely powerful pre-nerf and featured in many speedruns. Just past the quarter, we'll find the location hinted to us within the map looted at the Rhea Lucaria Academy main gate. Here we'll be able to loot the key we'll need to gain access to the Academy, sitting within the nest of a slumbering glintstone dragon. This fight with Smarg is pretty much the same as the one with Agheel, except with magic fire attacks and a comet projectile replacing his forward fire attack. The reskin of glintstone growing out of the dragon's head is a cool visual touch, but gameplay-wise, the same strategies developed within the Agheel fight will work for you here as well. And it is a thoughtful bit of design design that this fight is entirely optional when obtaining the key, as you can simply grab the key and dip if you're not interested in fighting him. Although, if you are, he'll drop a dragon heart and also add new draconic powers to the communion temples. After that, in a nearby Everjail, you can fight Balls, a Karian troll knight with a sword that can summon a great blade phalanx. Unfortunately, the version of this that he drops is only within sorcery form, and the weapon itself, obtained by fighting other Karian trolls, has a different Ash of War called Troll's Roar. It probably would have been quite overpowered if it did exist in Ash of War form, considering Glintblade Phalanx is already pretty busted, still pretty disappointing. Moving on, after ascending this hill, you'll come to see the four Belfries area, the first of which offers you an item called an imbued key. The other three have imp statue slots to place the keys, which will activate a nearby teleporter, each bringing you to a unique area of the game. The first will take you to bits of ruins visible from Sofri River, which a lone Crucible Knight stands somberly overlooking the cliffside on. There's a lootable glovewort item here, but the knight itself doesn't drop anything, which makes this belfry a pretty useless one. But it is cool to find, especially if you had noticed this guy while in Sofria and wanted to find a way to get to him. The next belfry requires looting another imbued key, one of which is found in Rhea Lucaria, and after obtaining it, you can return to slot the key and be granted access to the Chapel of Anticipation once more. Here you'll be able to challenge the Grafted Scion again, if you didn't beat him at the beginning of the game, and after overcoming it, you'll have access to the Dead Maiden placed at the very first point in the game whose blood you'll be able to soak Bear's cloth in to progress his questline. After returning to him, he'll give you a permanent PvP use item, and then offer you an item used to enter Mogwin Palace, which he claims he went out of his way to obtain for you. He then tells you that Luminary Moog is not yet ready for our audience, and that we'll have to wait to use the item. Yeah, sure thing, buddy. See ya, asshole! You'll also be able to loot an item from the Chapel of Anticipation called the Stormhawk King's Ashes, which you can present to Nefeli in an effort to cheer her up. And for the last Belfry, I've never actually used that one, so I'll let you know what I find in the next episode when I loot another imbued key in Kaelid. Now the next area past the Belfry is a small section of ruins in which you'll find a hidden staircase leading to a cellar boss fight with arguably the worst fight in the game, pitting you against one of the worst enemy designs with nearly zero telegraphing on most of its moves and field spanning acid vomit within a small arena. I fucking hate this boss. The entirety of the skill set of learning how to fight this prick is based on understanding to dodge before his attacks even begin to move. And also dipping out of any openings early as this enemy will punish you quickly and nearly unannounced with a large sweep attack at nearly any chance you have to deal damage. And enduring all of this is to simply obtain the Frozen Needle weapon, which is unique in offering a projectile on its heavy attack, but its damage is pretty garbage. The only other thing to note about the Royal Revenant is that they take damage when you use AoE healing spells near them, which is a cool detail 
considering the enemy is grafted with diseased or decaying limbs, doesn't make up for the garbage boss fight though. Just a bit further past the ruins and you'll finally meet the giant blacksmith that Blythe had spoken of. This is EG, a powerful vendor who can sell you infinite somber 1s and 2s as well as a handful of 3s and 4s. Rushing here after obtaining a decent pile of runes can give you a massive leg up in damage if utilizing a somber smithing stone weapon, and can be accessed first thing as soon as you get past the stranded graveyard. In fact, due to the open world nature of Elden Ring, you can get a plus 9 somber smith stone weapon very early if you get your hands on a somber 7, which I usually obtain in the Volcano Manor. However, this requires beating a godskin, which can be accomplished fairly easily with a good supply of sleep pots. EG also warns you of the dangers when approaching the Karia Manor just up the hill from here. This is again an instance of an NPC encouraging you to do something by telling you not to, however in this case I would argue that it's not exactly telegraphed all that well. If the danger was a boss fight or powerful enemy, one would naturally be encouraged to overcome the challenge with game skill, patience, and time. But when the danger is described as a spell ensnaring the area, it almost seems like the developers are telling you that you're not supposed to enter the area yet until dealing with the threat in one way or another. I don't know, maybe I'm being overly critical, but I don't necessarily feel encouraged to fight a spell unless that spell has a source that can be killed. I suppose it doesn't matter all that much because the spell itself isn't all that impressive and clearly can be subverted with torrent speed, which I imagine almost all players realized when approaching. However, before I continue with the legacy dungeon of Karia Manor, I want to cover the minor dungeons within Liurnia, of which there are only 8, and I will be again ranking them based on personal preference. In 8th place, we have the Cliff Bottom Catacombs, a pretty confusing and convoluted dungeon filled with imps and omens, and the final boss is an Erdtree Burial Watchdog, but this time the magic wielding variant. It's pretty straightforward, doesn't do all that much with the formula, and your reward will be the Caden Sellsword Spirit Summon Ashes. At 7th place, we have the Stillwater Cave, which you might be surprised to hear is so low mainly because the reward for being this boss, but keep in mind that there are only a handful of Liurnia Minor Dungeons, and many of them toy with the Minor Dungeon formula in some pretty interesting ways. This cave is filled with poisonous liquid, bats, poison mages, and Miranda flowers, and is pretty short if you take the most direct path to the boss. The boss itself is a sword and shield spear wielding clean rot knight which you fight in a pool of poison with limited area to escape the poison buildup. This will often result in accidentally dodging within the pool of liquid and therefore coating yourself in piss water and gaining a constant poison buildup effect which can be mitigated by use of the soap item. Kind of funny to think of yourself scrub-a-dub-dubbing in the middle of a fight to the death, but you gotta do what you gotta do. The boss itself has a pretty diverse moveset due to its many armaments at its disposable, as well as several Spear of Light attacks. I definitely consider Clean Rot Knights to meet the mark of mini boss, but I wouldn't reach much further than that. I find them fun in engaging the fight, but the backstab plays a huge part in being able to beat these enemies with relative ease. The rewards for beating it is the Winged Sword Insignia, which increases your damage with successive hits, and plays very well when using dual wielding builds. However, there are two other talismans that do its job and better. But for an early game version, it's quite useful in the meantime. At 6th place, I have the Academy Crystal Cave. This dungeon is very dark and filled with the expected glintstone crystals that Rhea Lucaria sits upon. The majority of the enemies within are Academy Crystal Mages, who once provoked will send a barrage of glintstone pebbles in your direction. There's also a Battle Mage enemy here who uses a more powerful glintstone spell as well as the Gavel and Cannon of Hayama spells, which can catch you off guard quite easily when attempting to rush the boss. The boss of this cave is a duo fight with the Crystallians, one with a spear and one with a mage's staff. Luckily, the devs included these statues to act as cover for the mage's spells while you deal with the more aggressive Spear Crystallion. I find that the Spear guy is one of the most easily parried enemies in the game, as his movement towards you requires him to activate his mini-hit stab attack, the timing of which should be engraved deep within your brain if you spend any time near them at all. This also makes their parry incredibly reliable and predictable, and with this strategy in mind, you should be able to make short work of them, especially when utilizing cover this arena so charitably provides. The remaining mage Crystallion has a handful of tricks up its sleeves, but without the aggression of its duo's partner, it can pretty easily be backstabbed or stance broken after memorizing its spells. The Crystallian bosses really aren't anything to write home about, except maybe the triple rotten Crystallian fight, but that's just because it's fucking bullshit. The real cool factor of this minor dungeon takes place after the fight, where you ride an extremely long elevator that takes you to the top of a tower that overlooks the top of Rhea Lucaria Academy. This tower will also contain your reward for the dungeon itself. 
the spell Terra Magica, one of the crucial parts of the mage cheese build that ruins the good name that mages could have otherwise had. Coming in at fifth place, I have the Rhodes and Catacomb, which has a spirit summon theme, including several ghost glove wart items to loot, many illusionary walls, and the boss itself being a spirit summoning snail. You can also loot the Erdtree Watchdog staff in this cave, which absolutely came in clutch for me on the double gargoyle fight later. The Ash of War is quite useful, and the Colossal Strike damage packs a pretty brutal punch. The Spirit Caller Snail fight begins with a spear-wielding Crucible Knight summoned at the center of the arena, the defeat of which does nothing to the health bar of the boss itself. Instead, another Crucible Knight will be called into battle once more, and your progress has reset itself. It isn't until you notice the source of the summoning in the form of the invisible snail that teleports around after being found that you'll make progress in the fight. Now this fight is somewhat reminiscent of the Witches of Hemwick from Bloodborne, a fight I absolutely despise as being gank fight nonsense with very little skill involved in overcoming. However, I find this fight to be much more balanced as a gank fight in a variety of subtle ways. For instance, the fact that this fight only has one aggressive entity within its arena makes it much less of an annoying headache and leaves far less room for being hit by cheap damage, or spammed by massive multi-hit combos, and once again I would like to point out that I'm not a fan of the Cemetery Shade boss, which is a reworked version of the Bloodborne enemy summoned multiple times within the Witches of Hemwick boss fight. It is also a cool mechanic to have the main health bar placed on a passive enemy that you can damage while leaving the majority of your attention on the summoned Crucible Knight. Beating this encounter will reward you with the Glenstone Sorcerer Spirit Summon Ashes. Now in fourth place, I have the Rhea Lucaria Crystal Tunnels, which doesn't offer all that much on face value, but is highly important as a source of regular smithing stones. There are multiple layers to its design, a handful of smithing stones to acquire throughout, but hands down the most notable aspect of this dungeon is the reward being a bell bearing that will allow you to purchase an infinite amount of smithing stone ones and twos. This is absolutely the most important bell bearing in the game, and therefore completing this dungeon will be an important moment of progress on most playthroughs. The boss you'll have to beat to gain access to the bearing is a ring-wielding Crystallion, who has access to a ranged attack that will likely not come into play, a basic melee combo, a spinning relocation move, and can throw his main ring for a strange ground boomerang attack that leaves him very vulnerable to backstabs. There's not much else to him but that. Coming in at third place, we have the Lakeside Crystal Cave, a very vertically designed dungeon that requires making several drops to progress further towards the boss fight at the bottom. The cave is populated with a gauntlet of crystal snails shooting magic projectiles at you, including at the very bottom of the cave just before you're ambushed by the boss, a Bloodhound Knight. I really like the design of the Bloodhound Knights. Their moveset and fighting styles are reminiscent of Slave Knight Gale in Phase 1 and the Dancer of the Boreal Valley, but seemingly at a more frantic pace. The way that Bloodhounds will activate moves with ranged openings to close the distance to you and keep you on your toes makes the fight dynamic and engaging in a way that many other mini-bosses fail to achieve. Also, it seems to me that the later moves within their moveset offer much more easily parried move, which makes learning to parry this boss's moves satisfying and offers engaging or rewarding gameplay after having learned them. It figures that many of the tools at the Bloodhound's disposal are powerful items in the player's hands as well, considering how well designed these fights are. The boss will drop the Cerulean Amber Medallion, but the cave continues, opening into an outcove on a cliffside in Lyernia. Here you'll meet the woman that Gideon had mentioned to you, an Albaneric woman whose wolf was slain by the Bloodhound Knight in an effort to force her to divulge where the second half of the Hallowed Tree Medallion is located. It can be assumed that this was done on Gideon's order as well, as it seems he's playing every angle available in an effort to uncover the secrets of the lands between. It's kind of crazy that dialogue this early in the game is already leading you down a path towards millennia at the bottom of the Hallig tree, but that's such a long distance away from where we stand now. By revealing to this woman that you were entrusted with one half of the secret Hallig tree medallion by Albus, she tells you her name is Latena, and then agrees to help you locate the second half, but only if you agree to take her with you to the Hallig tree. You agree, she says goodbye to her wolf, and then joins you in the form of Spirit Ashes. This minor dungeon has some really cool lore aspects. The number two spot is going to go to the Black Knife Catacombs, which features a very annoying headless spirit guarding the entrance. I'm not one to feed into the input reading narrative, especially considering the technical side of input reading claims have already been debunked, but this enemy is such a fucking troll teleporting away and becoming immune every time you attack an opening that isn't directly a backstab. Anyway, after entering the dungeon and finding the boss fight, you'll realize that it's a cemetery shade flanked by several skeleton adds, including an archer. Fucking miserable. The reward is the Twin Sage Sorcerer Ashes and a Death Root. However, this might have you wondering why this dungeon was called the Black Knife Catacombs. With further exploration, you can find several encounters of skeletons who will always resurrect until you defeat the enemy that's keeping them alive. 
Once defeated, their flock of skeletons will die, leaving every encounter a mini-puzzle of running past the initial spawns of skeletons to find and eliminate the source. After that, you will eventually discover that these guillotine traps can be ridden upward into a secret alternate path, ending in an illusionary wall that will reveal the hidden second boss of this dungeon. The boss is, appropriately, a Black Knife Assassin, this time with a destined death projectile at its disposal, which is, again, fitting considering the item it drops, which is an Assassin's Cerulean Dagger Talisman and a Black knife print key item, which will play into Fia's quest a bit later. I love to see when these dungeons give something really unique to chew on, such as these hidden areas and double bosses. And now for the number one spot. The best minor dungeon in Liurnia is without contest the ruin strewn precipice. After following the ravine in Liurnia to its end, you'll be met with a series of ladders reaching up the cliff face into what seems to be an ordinary but large mining cave full of smithing stones, mining enemies, and vulgar militia, oddly enough. However, after several chambers littered with loot, an elevator leading to another layer of the mine, and dozens of enemies throughout, you'll be surprised to learn that the proper dungeon hasn't even started yet. After surpassing the mining section of this area, which is just about as large as entire dungeons have previously been, you'll emerge at a midsection of the ravine, and enter the ruin-strewn precipice, and finally reach the starting bonfire of this dungeon. The rest of the dungeon will take you along the cliffside of the ravine, through bats, harpies, and land octopuses? How the fuck did land octopuses get up here? Whatever. The view from this area allows you to see just how far you have ascended along this path and up the cliffs of Liurnia, which is a pretty unique feel for a minor dungeon. Past more harpies and bats, you'll travel up one final lift before reaching a secondary bonfire placed just before the boss's fog wall. The boss is called Magma Worm Makar, an enemy who was detailed in lore as a human who communed with dragons so much they transformed into these pale imitations, forced to drag their bellies in the dirt. Which is kind of ironic that killing them grants you a spare dragon heart to spend on dragon communion as well as new spells in the communion inventory. I guess we don't really see them as cautionary tales. The fights with magma worms are awkward and sloppy, with pools of lava left behind on many of their attacks and also massive AoE slams with ridiculous reach. Their melee moveset is delayed like crazy and then often lands with little telegraph, the timing of which will vary based on your positioning. Their phase 2 transitions to a bipedal stance with an animation where they vomit lava onto their swords, which I didn't even get to see on this fight because the watchdog staff is too powerful. The reward for beating this boss, as I said, is Dragon Communion, as well as the Magma Worm Greatsword, and the real reward for beating the Ruins to Precipice is unlocking another of the three routes into Altus Plateau, and probably the coolest route being that you had to climb and fight your way all the way up the cliffside of Liurnia until beating the first instance of a powerful draconic enemy and emerging in Altus. A very cinematic and impactful moment, all of which is optional. I would argue that this is the absolute best minor dungeon in the whole game, and I don't think many would argue with me on that. And now with that out of the way, let's continue on to the Legacy Dungeon Finale, which should still cover a ridiculous amount of content. Once inside the Karian Manor, you could loot a recipe for ice pots, which will surely come in handy at many points throughout your travels, due to frostbite damage being very powerful and pot consumables being useful without requiring specific builds. This lower level of the manor also features an abundance of these hand enemies, which are coated in oil that can be ignited with fire damage triggering a one-time burning animation and which drop somber smithstones that drop at a level respected of the area they reside in, these being somber twos. On the second level, you'll be ambushed by a series of ghost soldier summons who assault you as you traverse these walkways, which you can fall off of the left side of to gain access to this locked chamber. Inside, you'll be able to loot the legendary Sword of Night and Flame, a weapon that manages to be good even despite having a quadruple stat requirement and scaling. After overcoming the ghosts, you'll ascend an elevator to the next level of the manor, which will greet you with several patrolling wolves, followed by battle mages, Akarian troll knight, and pages, all before reaching the boss of this dungeon, Royal Knight Loretta. Loretta is one of the more advanced horse fights, featuring a standard melee moveset, a horse buck back punish, an assortment of spells that get buffed in her face too, and she's parryable. Parrying results in the same interaction when parrying both regular and draconic tree sentinels, in which they entered a staggered state that acts as an opening to punish. Although I think the most effective means of damaging her is to abuse her use of a single weapon that can only attack on one side of her horse at a time. By baiting out two attacks on one side of her, and then using a jump attack to clear the area in which she would activate a back kick, you grant yourself a large enough opening to recover from the jump attack with just about any weapon. With this strategy, you don't necessarily need to learn the specifics of her entire moveset and focus more on nailing the timing and positioning of your attacks, which can safely be delivered while Loretta returns to a default stance in an effort to move her weapon to the other side of her. 
With some exceptions, this strategy works quite well on both sides of her, and leaves you to jump circles around her while damaging her in the process. There's also an added benefit that jumping attacks will leave you in a hunched over state while recovering, and so if you're remaining close enough to Loretta while attacking, then some of the attacks will swing over your head without hitting you. The trickier part of no hitting Loretta is managing her many instances of individual spell pieces she summons throughout. The glint blade phalanx projectiles can be easily strafed without even sprinting, however if you end up walking into a chair you're likely to eat a small hit. And that's even more dangerous when Loretta is actively attacking you while her phalanx is active which can sometimes result in unavoidable hits based on the angle of your dodge and the timing of her attack. The answer to this is to create so much spacing that you can activate all the glint blades before Loretta gets a chance to hit you, but that's pretty unengaging and boring. She also has a single squirt of glintstone projectile that gets upgraded to a tracking shotgun blast in her phase 2, which requires much more precise dodging to avoid it all. I would say the same of her glint bow attack, which can have alternate timings based on whether it hits you or hits behind you and explodes, and you'll have to be aware of that to be successful. The last attack of note within her moveset is her lightsaber glaive, which is pretty cinematic and straightforward while offering a rewarding opening after dodging it and it drops as an Ash of War upon Loretta's defeat along with her Glint Bow spell. Overall, Loretta is a challenging fight with a small health bar, mastering which will serve you quite well when the more powerful instance of her is introduced later. The following area is Ronnie's Rise, a glintstone filled section of gameplay with a dragon stalking around the staircase that leads to Ronnie. The dragon is called Glintstone Dragon Adula, and it flees upon reaching a health bar threshold, but we'll see it again soon. Along our way to Ronnie, there's an Ash of War Scarab, which will drop the Chilling Mist Ash of War for you, arguably the most powerful and versatile in the game. Being slottable in a wide variety of weapons and offering a source of frost damage that doesn't require any stats to use makes this ash easily S-tier. After ascending Ronnie's Rise, you can meet with the witch who previously called herself Rena a haunted doll created when Ronnie killed herself in body, leaving her soul to inhabit the doll's form. It's a cool parallel between her and Godwin, who she killed in soul and whose body is left to live as the Prince of Death. Despite all of that occultist weirdo shit, pretty much everyone agrees that she's fuckable. And I mean, I get it. But I already know I'm a freak, what's your excuse? Ronnie offers you a position in her conspiracy to usurp the Elden Ring with her Dark Moon and sets up a meet and greet with her other companions in spirit form, including Blythe, her shadow, e.g. her war counselor, and Celibus, the dickhead. Celibus tells you to meet him at the nearby rise and then mentions when you get there that he only offered out of courtesy. But while you're here, he lets you poison Nefeli Lu to progress his questline. You can instead give the poison to Gideon, which will progress the quest without killing Nefeli, but I only made it that far before forgetting about his quest and having him killed by Ronnie by finishing hers. If I remember correctly, his story is about him attempting to make a puppet spirit summon out of Ronnie, which doesn't even work, and then he gets puppeted himself, so not really missing out on much. After discussing with the other members of Team Ronnie, you'll learn that their main goal is to find a pathway into Nakron, an underground city that is cut off from the rest of the world. Blythe is looking into it from Sofria River, and your next goal is to meet up with him to discuss your plan of action. However, while in this area, you might as well find a hidden vendor placed within this area who sells my absolute favorite Ash of War in the whole game. By falling off the side of this cliff between the Loretta fight and Selvis's tower, you can platform down until reaching the previously unreachable upper portion of the room containing the second bonfire within the Karian Manor. Here you'll find a supplicant of Celibus named Pitya, who sells a variety of magic items, including the Ash of War Karian Retaliation. This shield Ash of War allows you to eat spells at the cost of a bit of mana and convert them into glintstone phalanx projectiles. This can be extremely useful when fighting any boss that consistently throws magic at you, which includes the Draconic Tree Sentinel's fireballs and the Black Flame projectiles of the Godskin fights. All of that while offering a parry with the same parry iframes as the Buckler's shield, which doesn't cost mana unless a spell is eaten in the process. A very satisfying expansion of the parry's utility, which you should absolutely throw on any shield you might be parrying with in whatever case it may come in handy. There's also an Ever Jail within the Ronnie's Rise area which contains an Onyx Lord. He has a pretty cool looking melee moveset including a punch that's parryable and can summon a barrage of meteors that doesn't really add much to the fight. I kind of hate these meteor moves for the most part. They seem to only exist in fights as these cinematic moments, but the implementation of them never feels like anything more than a large, easily avoidable projectile, or in one case, an insanely stupid, nearly unavoidable, unengaging barrage of nonsense. But we'll get to that. Fortunately, this lord only uses the meteor part of his move if you disengage from him, so sticking close will make the fight much more direct. He drops the sorcery meteorite as a reward. Continuing on Ronnie's quest, we meet up with Blythe and Safria. 
who tells us he hasn't figured anything out and maybe we should ask Selvis for help. Motherfucker, I was just there. You could have told me this is a ghost. You return to Selvis and he can't help you anyway, but he knows someone who can. A sorceress named Selin who we've met already in Limgrave. When he talks about her, he references that he helped her out when she was expelled from the academy. However, after handing Selin the letter of introduction, her first words are, Selavis is not a name I ever wanted to hear again. Bro is like the sorcerer equivalent of an incel nice guy who snaps and starts making puppets out of people so he can fuck them in his illusionary hidden wall basement. Anyway, we return to Selin and she tells us that the fate of the stars is bound by Radon the Star Scourge, who holds back the sky with pure big dick energy. As I mentioned earlier, I have already beaten Radon in this run, but I'll be talking about him, Kaelid, Mogwin's Palace, and Moog in the next episode in an Unlocking the DLC special. With his death, the sky is released of its bonds, and a comet is sent hurling towards Limgrave, which opens a hole in the Mistwood and reveals our path to Nakron. Speaking with Blythe tells us that he too will be joining us on our search for the hidden treasure that Rani has sent us to find. We begin our descent, seeing the first of these silver tier enemies, which this form exists as simple blobs, but the lore behind them is actually rather extensive. It turns out that the inhabitants of Nakron and Noxtella, called the Nox, had created these creatures in an effort to create life on a more grand scheme, to create one powerful enough to become Elden Lord. These artificial beings come in all kinds, from the basic blobs to the silver sphere enemies which drop larval tears, to eventually the Albinoric faction. This man-made origin reveals why some of the Albinorics are large-headed strange-looking creatures, while others are more humanoid yet lack function in their legs. Their imperfect nature is revealed within the lore we uncover here. Eventually we come across the Mimic tier boss fight, an enemy we can cheese by simply equipping a bow without arrows and unequipping everything else, leaving the Mimic nearly offenseless. When in this state, the enemy resorts to an attack that Gostok enemies have, in which they feebly throw a rock at you every once in a while. And if your weapon is fast enough, you can abuse the fuck out of the Mimic once they've entered the state in which they're attempting to drink from your flask. Kind of a cool gimmicky fight that you can use a variety of unorthodox methods to beat in many humorous ways. The following area is the Ancestral Woods, an upgraded version of the Sofria River with the same mechanic involving lighting six shrines at various points with various set pieces along the way. This leads you to another instance of an Ancestral Spirit fight, this time being the Regal Ancestor Spirit, which is a Remembrance fight. This version of the deer is not remarkably different than the original. It has a handful of new moves based on the spirit animals roaming the area, which the boss can teleport to and absorb their soul, gaining a new move in the process. The little rabbit looking things will give the deer a hopping stomp attack, the boar will give it a charging attack, and the ram will give it a rolling attack, but none really stand out. They're all pretty straightforward and not all that dangerous so you won't have to focus on learning each move with much investment at all. The biggest downfall of this boss is in its ridiculous healing move that sucks off all the spirit animals in the area, healing for nearly the whole health bar, all while dealing a constant area of effect attack around itself in the process. So there's no counterplay and no trade-off for the huge turning of the tables. And the attack itself isn't telegraphed with much urgency at all, so you're likely to take damage simply by standing too close when the move activates. The move is at least somewhat balanced by having a reduced efficiency each cast and only being usable at lower and lower health thresholds, but that doesn't change the meta that this move builds within the fight. This fight becomes exponentially more easy the more damage you're able to do, being that you'll see exponentially less moves when the odds of seeing its soul siphon decreases. Which would be fine if this was anywhere close to an endgame fight in which you would be required or at least encouraged to learn its entire moveset. Instead, the deer is left with 6k health which can be absolutely dumpstered in a few hits with an endgame build. Which is made even worse when considering this fight nets you just about nothing of value and therefore no reason to complete it any earlier than any other fight. It drops a remembrance that offers a talisman you've never heard of and don't care about, and a weapon with a kind of cool ash of war, but not much other than that. Ultimately, I'm left in the sad conclusion that this fight could have absolutely taken place instead of the double gargoyle fight, which is trash and I'll get to shortly. If the deer had been blocking something potentially valuable, learning its fight's ins and outs would be that much more valuable. But instead, it's left in this unfortunate place where it's not well enough designed or rewarding enough to be worth anything more than an afterthought. And that sucks because it looks really cool and the mechanics around it could have been cool, but it's just a missed opportunity following the path behind the deer fight and we enter into an aqueduct structure with two crucible knights. One with a sword and shield, which will drop the crucible horn shield upon its defeat, and the other an antler spear wielding knight that doesn't drop anything. Or maybe he survived the fall. 
Never mind, he drops a somber smithstone six. A short ways past these knights, and you'll enter one of the most poorly designed gank fights I've ever seen. The double gargoyle fight is meant to be a skill check blocking off your access to the deep druid depths, and therefore up Ryan's Cell River unless you use Ronnie's route and the Lake of Rot. However, this fight absolutely spits in the face of actual game skill in the same way that the DS1 double gargoyle fight does the same thing. This is no real skill check. It is a damage and health check. I've beaten every main boss SL1, including no hitting Millennia, Moog, and every other fight that's worth my time. But this fight is so ridiculously unbalanced that you would need insane RNG to even be able to stand a chance when using low health, low damage builds. And if you ask me, that is just insulting, especially when it's a fight that roadblocks content. If this was an open world fight you could walk past, it would be one thing. If it was a cheesable fight, it would be one thing. If they were vulnerable to status effects, it would be one thing. But making this fight absolutely airtight bullshit is fucking crazy. And that's not even mentioning how the fight almost seems designed directly to eliminate your spirit summon. The poison pool attack is so annoying, offering no openings, limited visibility so as to understand where the limits of it are, and a field spanning version for the secondary less aggro boss to use. The cherry on top is that your spirit summon will bathe in this stuff every chance they can get. I attempted this fight for like 6 hours with an underleveled bloodhound's fang and only a handful of lucky runs where I got down to a single boss only to choke every time. It wasn't until I returned wielding the Watchdog Staff, which offers strike damage, the Gargoyle's weakest resistance, fat poise damage, as well as a ranged Ash of War I could use when they puke, that I beat the fight in one try. My knowledge of the fight didn't change, I just got more damage. And I beat it. And that fucking sucks ass, and I don't want to talk about these pricks anymore. Beating this fight will grant you access to the Miyazaki Mobile, FromSoft's preferred method of travel. A coffin. Seriously, how many times have they used this? You ride the coffin to the deep root depths, an interesting area that represents the conflict between the Golden Order's ideals of rebirth through returning to the Erd Tree and the blasphemous influence of the Prince of Death. While crossing these routes to get to the main area of Deep Root, you can take an alternate side path which will run through a small cavern infested with ants, including these honeypot ants who have been chewing on the roots of the Erd Tree and will drop a Numen rune upon their defeat. By reaching the end of this cave, you'll loot the Elden Stars incantation. The significance of its placement here is... Something, probably, I don't know. Further in, you'll see a twisting of roots leading you to the upper layers of Deep Root. Here, you'll be able to take your revenge on the gargoyles. And by hopping off the roots and landing near this bonfire, you'll have reached Godwin's final resting place, the Prince of Death's Throne. The grotesque influence of the Death Blight affliction has turned his corpse into this twisting visage, which has appeared all throughout the lands between to mark Death's presence. Flies surround him, and death blight vines have sprouted all throughout the area, twisting and infecting their way through the Erd Tree's roots, which were meant to receive his soul. Pretty fucking metal imagery, and I hope he comes to life as a boss fight in the DLC. Approaching the foot of his throne sets off Fia's defensive measures in the form of this invader style boss fight, which, if online, will pull builds from those who have embraced Fia to fill the role of the boss fight. I'd like to see the people who get me as their invader and end up hitting me once with a dagger and I explode. The offline version of this fight involves fighting a knight with a twin blade in shield, then Sorcerer Roger, who is no longer enfeebled in this form. Kinda a shame, he's pretty powerful as a spellblade. He's able to buff his weapon with magic, summon Glintblade Phalanx, throw Glintstone Pebbles at you, and summon a Glintstone Rain spell. All of this without having to hit the Chug Jug to refill his FP bar. This is one of those fights that's obviously not difficult, but it is difficult for me being that I'm generally one shot by every single move they throw at me. The final stage of this fight features two more Fia's champions alongside Lionel the Lionhearted who spams this skull incantation while chasing you down. Finding a completely safe opening to attack is pretty tedious, but there are plenty of spells and Ashes of War that can help in the process. The ultimate of which is to use the Sacred Relic Sword's Ash of War, which blankets the field in holy damage, even hitting all three of the final champions each attack. After beating this fight, I return to the Deep Roots exploratory area to kill this unique Crucible Knight named Sluria, who guards this hollow tree stump. Again, I'm a pretty big fan of the Crucible Knight enemies, both in their complex and well-balanced movesets, and also in the dramatic positions you'll usually find them in. I remember first thinking of them to have the most gaudy and ugly designs with the strange bright bronze color of their equipment, which reminds me of the palettes used in DS2's enemy designs such as the Dragon Riders. But at this point, having seen all of them and having come to understand their place within this world as these primordial warriors who represent different aspects of the Crucible in a much more dignified way than the Omens or Misbegotten, they find their place as an important staple enemy unit to stumble upon at various points throughout the Lands Between. Upon her 
Spur defeat, you'll obtain the Crucible Antler Spear weapon called Solaria's Tree, and you'll be able to loot the matching armor set in the chest behind her. You'll also find another walking mausoleum here, which can be brought down after landing on top of it by traversing these routes, a fitting solution to a deep root puzzle. The last important facet of this area is the second transportation coffin, which will bring you to Upper Einsel River, which I will return to upon making further progress in Ronnie's quest. So for now, we return to the Round Table Hold and progress Fia's questline so as to gain access to the Lich Dragon Fortisax fight in Clear Deep Root. Embracing her will allow her to trauma dump some lore on you as well as progress her story in which she mentions Roger. Talking to him will reveal that he's close to death and wishes to apologize for the trouble his death might bring you. I believe he's referencing his part in the Fia's Champions fight, but since I had beaten it far earlier than you would be expected to, I believe this is just an oversight. Either way, sleep well, sweet prince. I'll carry your weapon and its nasty ash of war all the way with me to the Elden Throne. Reloading the round table and then speaking to Fia again will have her revealing the location of the black knife print that I've already looted. Reload and return to her once more and she'll ask you to find the owner of a weathered dagger, which you'll find that D will offer to take it and deliver it to them. After which, you can reload the hold to find that Fia and D have moved locations to this secluded now open chamber where D lays dead with deathblight roots growing out of his corpse. You can loot his armor, which will be used in a quest step later on involving D's strange relationship with his twin brother whom he shares a soul with, you can also at this point meet with the best NPC that FromSoft has ever created, the Loathsome Dung Eater. He sits here in an invader form surrounded by human corpses and asks you if you've ever felt the Omen Curse, which he realizes you have not, and then he asks you to leave him be. If you choose to disturb him again, he tells you that the piece of the round table is the only thing keeping him from beating your ass, which is oddly reserved for a character like him. Ensha broke the piece of the hold, and he's just a meaningless goon of Gideon. Anyway, to progress any further in Fia's quest, we'll need an item we'll get along the path through Ronnie's, which means we'll first be finishing the final area in Nokron. The path requires jumping across various rooftops and avoiding many silver tiers which mimic into crossbow-wielding Nox. Eventually, we'll reach a stone sword key-locked room that contains a chest holding the absolute most powerful spirit summon in the game, the Mimic tier. The Mimic requires you to sacrifice 660 health to summon, and that's more than I've almost ever had. I think I've summoned him one time, and it was unleveled and died in like one hit. For those of you who don't know, the Mimic tier is a summon who will spawn as a Mimic of your build, with all of your weapons, armor, talismans, and spells equipped just as the Mimic tier boss fight did. The implementation of which can essentially double the effectiveness of your build by offering a secondary source of status effect or damage all while tanking hits for you. As I mentioned, I don't really use spirit summons all that often, but the Mimic tier is a very cool option for the players who wish to play with themselves. At the end of this section, you can find a chest containing Ronnie's sought after prize, a Finger Slayer Blade, as well as a great Ghost Glove Wart, which you can use as the final piece to upgrade your Mimic tier summon. Upon returning to Rani and giving her the Finger Slayer Blade, she'll offer you a Karian Inverted Statue, which can be placed on the empty pedestal in the Karian Study Hall. The placement of which will flip the rest of the tower upside down in a very cool visual that doesn't really offer all that much gameplay-wise. It would have been cool if the inversion offered some kind of a puzzle towards completing the Study Hall, but what we got was an interesting, magical way to approach level design. Unfortunately, Prospector Miriam has been resurrected, and will assault us with Glintstone Bow Spells as we attempt to traverse the inverted study hall. A useful tip I can offer is to use serpent arrows and a bow more leveled than mine to trigger poison on Miriam before you damage them enough to teleport away, in which case you'll likely have damaged them enough to let the poison finish them off while you deal with the many hand enemies. With the main threat removed, you can safely fall down the architecture of the chamber, landing on the inverted chandeliers and then the rafters, and then finally reaching the previously unreachable elevator that had been above us the whole time on our first visit. At the bottom, you'll exit the study hall and enter a long walkway, leading to the Divine Tower of Liurnia, but you'll first be invaded by a godskin noble. This enemy is a rotund, sacrilegious black flame mage wearing the skin of some unnamed gods in the tackiest and ugliest fashion possible. Also, he has a dragon tail. People don't talk about that enough, why the fuck does he have a tail? One of the main features of the godskins is their incessant spamming of black flame fireball, especially so in their duo fight. However, with the Karian Retaliation Ash of War, we turn this strength against them. This is by far easier to do against one of them at a time, but can also be very useful within the duo fight. If you ask me, I would say the godskins create an atmosphere within their fights that favor disengagement, in the noble's case because of his multi-hit stab moves, that don't time well within single dodges. 
that as well as his incredibly fast belly slam that becomes the Noble Presence spell within his phase 2, dealing significant black flame damage, and the move which ignites a ring of black flame spouts around him. And this might be one of the many reasons, subconsciously, that people end up hating these fights, being that they'll punish you for being too close, and then spam ranged attacks at you, especially while you're healing. If you're not just giving in and abusing the awesome power of sleep pots on these pricks, then I imagine most players adopt a hit and run style of gameplay. But even that will only be ever so effective when their wacky phase 2 moves enter the battlefield, which I'll go into detail on in later fights in subsequent episodes. For now, let's just say fuck these guys, but I do find them to be fun to fight at times. Especially so if you allow yourself to use powerful Ashes of Wars and spells. After ascending the tower, you'll find this scene featuring Ronnie's original body, slain by her own hand in order to free her soul. You can still see some of the Radagon lineage's signature red hair on her corpse. Looting her will give you a talisman for increasing your intelligence by 5 and the curse mark of death which Fia requires for her quest. By returning to Fia and engaging with her in conversation, she'll first assume you to be there to kill her, ordered by the dogmatic brutes of the Golden Order, at which point you can tell her that you wish to be held, and she'll then offer you more information regarding the requirements she'll need to meet her goals, which include the Curse Mark of Death. Lucky for her, we just so happen to have a spare one. After reloading a bunch and getting more hugs, she'll eventually fall deep asleep into a dream that channels the Prince of Death the deathbed dream, entering which will put us face to face with Godwin's dragon friend and protector, the Lich Dragon Fortisax. Now before I begin critiquing this mess of a fight, let me just get out of the way how fucking cool this boss is. The design of a once golden dragon being afflicted by the death root turning him black and firing off rich red bursts of lightning while taking place in this haunted piece of the Erdtree roots within a witch's nightmare is an aesthetic masterpiece. The fight itself, however, is the absolute definition of too much going on. Getting too close to the dragon will place an electric marker on you which will strike a bolt of red lightning at you after a few seconds. This is easy enough to deal with by simple sprinting, but in such cases as Fortisax's intro move, you'll also have to worry about the many clouds of death lightning summoned around him. And following that, whatever the dragon decides to do next, which can include a tail sweep or lightning slam which produces electric waves. On top of all those ambient effects, many of which become layered on top of one another, this boss's melee moves are followed by second secondary electric blasts, making positioning key to your success. On a melee build, this means recognizing which moves will reach the lightning after effects towards you, in which case you'll have to dodge into the attack, or eschewed from it enough to escape the second hit. This often results in you entering the range that will activate the electric marker upon you, and I recommend exiting behind Fortisax to avoid his subsequent melee moves while you run out the electric lightning strike. However, all of this extra effort results in basically no safe openings for you, as you'll need to make enough distance to avoid any back punishes or special moves that might target you. Ultimately, this fight is one that I had mentioned in which you're so much better off giving yourself a ranged option to land headshots on the boss without entering the range where multiple effects will be targeting you at once, and where you'll be positioned outside of the range where his melee attacks are more of a threat than a single hit. With a high level pulley bow and backwards jump attacks, this fight is made into a joke where you see a total of 6 moves before the boss gets totally dicked down. But with this low level cobbled together mage build, I managed to get a somewhat engaging fight out of the dragon without overpowering him too much. Fortisax's moveset also includes two moves in which he flies into the air, giving a cinematic change of perspective that shows off the strange changes to the skybox within the dream. The first of which is a quick slam attack without much fanfare, and the second is a blade made of lightning that he'll delay in the air before slamming down and slicing twice. To me, this attack is reminiscent of Placidusix's lightning nuke move, which has a huge degree of atmospheric value but offers nothing gameplay-wise. I've never once been hit by either move, and I would be surprised to hear anyone who has without directly trying to be hit by them. He also has a fire breathing attack which oddly enough will always veer to your left when looking at him, so you'll always want to run to the right to successfully avoid him. This fight is only difficult from a viewpoint of its many overlapping mechanics, which build to the strange unnatural caution you'll have to take while fighting him. I believe he only has 12,000 health and no phase 2 and that's kind of a shame. This is essentially the final boss fight of Fia's quest, which is one of the ending rune quests, and for most, it only amounts to a fight you'll crush with an overpowered endgame build before moving on to a more engaging fight. Its real value comes from insane aesthetics and important lore implications, and I guess that's enough for a non-mandatory fight that's tied to an NPC quest. After beating the fight, you'll load back into the Prince of Death's throne room with Fia still sleeping, but a mending rune of the Death Prince now lootable on her body. 
The last bit of her quest involves finishing these, by finding his currently soulless twin brother and offering him the twinned armor set to restore him. Taking the place of the murdered D, he'll set out to get revenge. By loading back into the Prince of Death's throne, you can find him standing over Fia's recently slaughtered corpse, yapping about how those who live in death commit 50% of all violent crimes or something. At which point you can reload the area to find his corpse as well, which you can now reclaim the twinned armor set and take the inseparable sword from. This is the end of a major plot point in the NPC stories. From Roger exploring Stormvale and accidentally stumbling upon Deathroot, to Dee's hunt for those who live in death, which ended in his assassination. They all ended up here, at the corpse of Godwin. Fia is slain after completing her goal of comforting the dead, something she may or may not have been okay with. And Dee, who was dedicated to the extermination of a faction of enemies that the Golden Order declared blasphemous, is dead after exacting his revenge. Perhaps never knowing that Fia succeeded in creating the Mending Rune of the Death Prince. And none of them were any wiser to the fact that I'm not even going to use this Mending Rune. Because I'm trying to get some haunted blue doll pussy. We continue down Ronnie's quest by entering Upper Einsel River, looting this miniature Ronnie doll item nearby the first bonfire. After sitting at the Sight of Grace and selecting the option Talk to Miniature Ronnie three times, she'll speak through the doll by first clowning on us for being a weird freak who talks to inanimate objects. And excuse me, but I'm not the one who killed myself and my brother just to put my soul into a four-armed sex doll. I'm hardly the weird one here. Anyway, she orders us to eliminate a baleful shadow that stalks Upper Einsel, which we'll encounter soon enough. In the next area features a cocooned Estelle, which we can kill for 7k runes and a somber smithstone 7. Past this threat, we'll uncover the hidden city of Noxtella, which features two main paths to progress through. You can take the ground level, which is filled with many silver tiers, or go through the upper architectural path, which has many small pieces of loot, several silver spheres that stalk you along the paths, and ends in a fight with two silver tiers and a Nox. Their defeat will allow you to loot the legendary talisman called the Moon of Noxtella, which increases your memory slots. And I can't see why anyone would ever use this. Why would you dedicate an incredibly valuable talisman slot to do something that memory stones do passively and give you like 12 slots without much effort. Maybe I'm missing something because I don't invest all that hard into spells, but I can't see why anyone would need that many more spell slots. Behind this fight you'll find an elevator that drops you down onto a platform that you can loot a golden seed at, and then drop down to the end of the ground level path. Here you can loot a somber 7 behind some electric silver tiers, and look down to see the arena we had previously fought the ice lightning dragonkin soldier. Now a bit further down this path, and we'll come across the baleful shadow that Ronnie had tasked us with defeating. It's an invader reskin of Blythe, but becomes more important to understand what a shadow is in Elden Ring to come to terms with what's happening here. A shadow is in some way the two fingers attempting to influence how Empyreans act through offering them a useful companion, in the form of a half-wolf beast man. In Merica's case, it was through Malekith, whom she tasked with sequestering the Rune of Death outside of time in Faramazula, so her and her lineage would become immortal. And that situation of a shadow being used and then deserted in an unreachable place seems to be a recurring theme in the Empyrean stories, such as in Blythe's current predicament, being imprisoned in the same Everjail we once fought Bloodhound Knight Darrowell alongside his side in. The notion that he is a machination of the two fingers, and that he might interfere with her grand schemes, led War Counselor E.G. to block Blythe the way, something you can undo or which can be undone upon completing Ronnie's questline. This baleful shadow could be the two fingers attempting to correct the issue of Ronnie's shadow being MIA with its rage born from the stubborn rebellion of her actions. Fortunately for her, she brought along the unforeseen help of the Tarnished, who's been the linchpin in her success. It's a pretty cool thought to know that if we, the Tarnished, never find her, and never see her through her various tasks required for her ascension, then the two fingers essentially win and beat her back at every step of the way. If we don't kill Radon, she fails. If we don't find the Fingerslayer Blade, she fails. And if we don't beat this Baleful Shadow, she fails. All of which is followed by her need for an Elden Lord to usurp Merica and replace the Elden Ring with her Dark Moon. After beating the Shadow, she says this. My thanks. It was more of a challenge than I envisioned. Now I can finally stand before them. This is farewell, my dear. Tell Blythe and E.G. I love them. <laughs> In this moment, she fully realizes our potential and value to her before offering us this discarded palace key. 
which says in its flavor text that she discarded this key alongside her flesh. With some inference and the knowledge that this key opens a chest containing her wedding ring, we can understand that Rani threw away her body and therefore her hopes of becoming a bride to the Elden Lord. Her original goal would seem to have been to ascend the throne herself, but upon being thwarted at every step of the way, only to break ground through the actions of an ambitious and loyal tarnished, she sees the true path of her fate. Using the power of simphood to topple the established rule of this world and place herself in the 1% of OnlyFans creators. Now the following area is an infamously terrible nightmare location born in Miyazaki's wettest dream, a poisonous swamp on steroids, the Lake of Rot. Traversing this area will involve reaching several pressure pads that will raise these platforms out of the lake, giving you a less rotten path through. However, the more common method involves taking a quick dip in the liquid, coating yourself in rot. This will continuously build your Scarlet Rot status. However, if triggered when outside of the swamp itself, you'll find the actual Scarlet Rot status effect will be a much more manageable amount of damage per tick. You should then be able to cross the swamp with no problem, so long as you have around three Crimson Flasks at your disposal. One of the more prominent features of the lake is this fight with a Dragonkin soldier placed in the middle. There is a section of platforms you can raise in order to find a safe place to stand while fighting, but a fight such as this will often have you moving around quite a lot in an effort to avoid tax and deal damage effectively. In many cases, you'll find these platforms to be inadequate space to fight the Dragonkin, in which case you'll fall into the lake and have to transition to another platform. And if you find yourself in a position where you have to use a dodge while standing in the lake, you'll inadvertently find yourself coated in rot. You'll want to have rotten boluses, or the incantation Flames Cleanse Me on hand in such instances, the latter of which you can find on a corpse within a fire monk camp just south of the Church of Vows. Now the boss fight itself is nothing special, which is probably a good thing considering the setting. However, I do think it's a missed opportunity to not have a rotten dragonkin boss fight placed on less dangerous footing. If the phase 2 of the ice lightning dragonkin was reskinned to place pools of rotten liquid on its slam attacks, the fight would have been much more memorable. Instead, this boss is the lackluster regular version of the dragonkin, which you can find in Safria, and you'll likely remember the lake itself as the main source of danger over the dragon. I do think the weapon that's dropped as a reward for this fight, the dragon scale katana, is a very cool reward for the most annoying and difficult of the three fights. However, Thematically, the weapon, which has an intrinsic Ash of War, which strikes Ice Lightning and coats the armament for a short time, would be more appropriate to drop on the Ice variant of the boss. In fact, the Dragon Halbert, which drops on the original Dragon King in Sofria, has an Ash of War that is simply called Spinning Slash, and doesn't mention that it also summons Ice Lightning and imbues the weapon. And so, the only fight that doesn't drop an Ice Lightning weapon is the Ice Lightning Dragonkin, which is kind of funny. In hindsight, I wish this dragon was somehow a Rotten Lightning variant, which would drop a a rotten lightning katana, but maybe that's far too much wishful thinking. It's an annoying fight, but I don't mind it so much because the dragonkin are pretty well designed. After traversing the lake, you'll find yourself at the final bonfire before the fight with Estelle, and before your progress is halted by needing Ronnie's wedding ring to continue, which means we'll be transitioning our attention to the Rea Lucaria Academy. Now that we have the key to the academy gate, we can pass through it, ending up on a split of three pathways. One is an elevator to the academy, one leads you back to the main gate, and one will lead you to the Bellum Highway. But the obvious, but not entirely obvious facet of these magical gateways is that you can also just walk past them to see what you would skip in between the teleports. One side features a hidden vendor who will sell sleep-related items, and the other has a red summoning sign which you can use to summon alongside Yuria and help him defeat one of the festering fingers. The fight is with a Raven Mount assassin who uses the jump attack build featuring the Black Raptor Feathers chest piece and the Raptor's Talons weapon. Beating this invasion will reward you with the Raptor of the Mists Astrovor and will allow you to speak with Yuria just nearby the summoning location. He'll thank you for your help by giving you a rock he found on the ground and then he'll cryptically mention the Violet Bloody Finger Eleonora who he might be in love with. I'm not sure. I always just thought he was nervous about the dangers of fighting a difficult foe, but maybe it was some forbidden love story. I think I saw a TikTok about it and then never looked into it. Anyway, we'll then take the elevator up to the academy before ascending the Elden Ring equivalent of the Beaches of Normandy, in the form of these two pebble-spamming pricks guarding this door. We'll head out back through this graveyard filled with corpsemen, dogs, and marionette soldiers before eventually reaching the water wheel and ascending to the schoolhouse site of grace which will be our checkpoint for the next boss. The run back of which will have us sprinting through various mages, some patrolling the halls, and others obliviously reading books before we ascend a set of stairs and eventually make it to the boss fog wall. The boss here is the Red Wolf of Radagon, which begs the question, if Renala and Radagon are broken up, then why is his wolf here at the academy? Did Renala take Bro's dog in the divorce, or did Radagon just leave him here? 
Either way, it kind of fucked up. I can't say I'm a fan of the Red Wolf fights. It alternates between jumping away from you to perform barking spells, to sprinting towards you to nip at you with difficultly timed biting moves. On occasion, these states overlap, creating situations where you're dodging away from a bite only to be hit by three tracking carry and phalanx spells, or vice versa. The saving grace of this fight is that his health bar is very small. But even when doing this fight last on an all remembrance no hit run, it still takes its landing a single hit, which can be dangerous. I don't trust any of his moves to be entirely safe damaging on except for the lightsaber jumping slam, which has a pretty huge opening. The biggest fuck you of this fight is the double spinning lightsaber, which almost guarantees a hit if you're within the range of bolt swings. You'll have to disengage early to make distance to avoid the potential of this move on every opening if you're playing the fight completely safe. There is potential that this move will only activate on certain positioning situations, but I can't say for sure because I don't have an insane amount of experience with it. In most runs, I'll avoid this fight and Renala because I don't find either all that much fun or all that difficult. They are simply stressful when attempting to no-hit them. Beating this fight will reward you with a memory stone. The following area is the final section of the academy, a large courtyard with a broken spiral staircase to your right that will be your means of progression. You'll jump across to one of the struts and proceed up the stairs with a silver sphere trap continuously falling down towards you. After passing it, you'll come across Moongrum, a Karian knight that stands before the elevator leading to Renala. This knight has access to the Karian Retaliation Ash of War and will use it with immense efficiency. One tip I can lend to you is to utilize the powerful upgraded version of stealth offered in Elden Ring. Crouching within the nearby shrubbery will eventually reset Moongrum's stance, facing him towards the entrance and allowing you to slip out of sight behind him for an easy backstab. With Moongrum out of the way, we'll have a clear path to Renala, but first let's check out some of the other pathways within this section of the academy. From here we can unlock a shortcut back to the last bonfire and also jump over this railing to enter the rooftop section of Rhea Lucaria. The rooftops are filled with marionette soldiers, however the carrion phalanx Ash of War will stance break most basic enemies with one barrage, making a lot of potentially difficult encounters much more manageable. I'll have to thank Roger again next time I see him. A little ways into the rooftop section and we'll find the second imbued key which I then use to access the Chapel of Anticipation. We can then enter this building through the window leading to the rafters before falling onto a chandelier with a spare Academy Glintstone key. And a bit further, we'll find this unique crab that'll drop the Twin Sage Glintstone Crown, which will increase our intelligence, but decrease our health and stamina. Both of these items will be key to our next steps. Firstly, I'll return to Thops, returning his lost key to him and allowing him to return to the Academy. He'll thank you by giving you the Iridition gesture before setting off to the Academy. We can now return to the rise above Bellum Highway and use this gesture while wearing any of the Glintstone crowns near this Statue of America, which once completed will open the seal of the rise. Inside we'll find a graven mass and we'll be able to loot the cannon and gavel of Hayama spells from the chest at the top chamber. Returning to the schoolhouse side of Grace, we'll stumble on Thops' final resting place, where he died studying. Bummer. Anyway, now that we've basically cleared out Rhea Lucaria, the only thing we have left to do is defeat the boss. We'll ascend the elevator and enter Bradala's chamber, which is filled with these creepy reborn creatures that she'll affectionately refer to as Sweetings. These ads make up the bulk of her phase one, being a mini game of finding the one singing broad and hitting her with any amount of damage before moving on to the next. I attempt to achieve this effectively with throwing knives, but this often results in an awkward experience attempting to lock onto the correct target, mostly unsuccessfully. You do this three times and then Renala descends to the ground with her overshield breaking. Renala is clutching an amber shard that Radagon had gifted to her at some point before dipping, which she has now become obsessed with and detached to reality. She uses this piece of the Erd Tree to rebirth these scholars, which gives a weird tone to the restatting mechanic she offers after beating her fight. I usually attempt to beat Renala's phase 1 in one damage phase because this type of mechanic to a fight is far from engaging, especially so when the one special sweeting is hiding somewhere and I've got a sound whore like I'm playing Rainbow Six Siege to find her. The real fight begins in phase two, but even that is almost a lie. Renala will send periodic spells in your direction, but the whole time she's backing away from you, making this fight somewhat reminiscent of Gwendolyn's fight in DS1. It's the standard mage boss fight where they don't have any decent close range offensive abilities and therefore don't offer anything to engage with up close, simply choosing to push you away with AoEs. Cinematically it's pretty cool, however the fight is almost a scripted situation. You'll see her Izzur Comet, you'll see her Moon Attack, and then you'll have done enough damage to activate her Phase 2.5, 
where she gives up on fighting and sends spirit summons to do it for her. She summons wolves, a bloodhound's knight, a dragon, and a giant, all of which are suspiciously similar to the crew that helped Ronnie if you include the dragon which guarded her rise. In fact, being that Ronnie is the one who first gifts you with the spirit calling bell and that Renala survives the fight, there are theories that this fight is actually a fight with Ronnie. Perhaps she drags you into the spirit realm to test your mettle as a way of brokering some kind of peace between you and Renala. This is all speculation because not a lot about any of this fight makes any sense, but whatever. It's not that good of a fight, so it might as well have some kind of lore implications. After beating her, Renala allows you to spend larval tears to reallocate your stats, and you'll have access to the chest containing Ronnie's Dark Moon Ring, which we can use to progress our questline. And so we return to the backside of the Lake Arat and stealth our way through the prawns before taking another coffin, which will lead us to the fight with Estelle, natural born of the void. Estelle will generally begin the fight with a tricky positioning situation in the form of his tail slam move, which he'll usually use on your first and subsequent approaches to him. This move will have two separately timed hitboxes based on your proximity to him, which you'll have to learn the timing of and guess the hitbox you'll want to avoid in the moment. Another situation of potential positioning issues is when he activates his tail thrust poking move, which can be avoided by being too close to him or too far away from it. If you have a ranged option, it's much better to simply stand outside of the range of the pokes and fire away. However, melee builds will have to push through, hit him in the head, and then disengage before any potential proximity punishes can activate. Estelle is another fight that I would recommend having an option for a source of ranged damage to effectively damage him on. This is so you can get the most out of his openings without having to worry about his two proximity punish moves, those being the multi-hit ground void attack, which gets upgraded in phase two, and his gravity slam. Both of these moves are tricky and are absolutely begging you to avoid with distance rather than dodges. Estelle doesn't have the most health in the world, and so if you're lucky and have a lot of damage, you'll trigger a stagger critical before hitting half health and activating his phase two meteor move. His critical animation should leave you enough time to jump attack his head before activating the critical attack and enough time after to get another hit in. If you're lucky and you've hit all your openings, you won't have to deal with his meteor move, which is one of the most lazy and egregiously insulting moves in all of Elden Ring. The entire arena is filled with meatballs, and unless you have eight eyes that can independently track all of these projectiles at once, then your only option is to spam dodge and hope. I would be absolutely thrilled to be wrong about this. If anyone has a legitimate method to avoid this move, I would love to hear about it, because this shit just sucks even to the point where the projectile simply phased through Estelle in an effort to hit you. Overall, a fight like this is easy to disregard. Giant beast fights are usually pretty sloppy and mostly don't engage with you in ways that fit the playstyle of a tiny human. I would argue that Madeir in DS3 does it best, unrealistically offering Yu's head for openings after many of his attacks. If we judge Estelle on gameplay alone, he's basically garbage. However, where these fights shine is in the spectacle and he is nothing if not a spectacle. Past Estelle, we'll find an elevator that brings us to the Moonlight Altar towering over Liernia, a fitting final area for this episode. Just up the hill towards the final step of Ronnie's quest, we'll be united with the Glenstone Dragon Adula. This fight is the ultimate of the Wyvern-style dragon fights. Her health bar is huge, which almost guarantees that you'll see the move she so graciously restrained herself from unleashing on you in your first encounter which is a frozen flying sword slash called Adula's Moonblade. This move is so unnecessarily tricky, as it often occurs after you've already made distance after a magic flame AO, and you'll have to close the distance while also having been dismounted from Torrent so as to dodge through the attack and into the area behind the lingering ice damage. This move is pretty tricky in an otherwise simple dragon fight, however it will grant you three dragon hearts and the spell Adula's Moonblade. After surpassing her dragon guard, you can fall into this hole seemingly left behind when Ronnie's two fingers crashed from the sky into the ground here. Dropping to the bottom chamber will reveal the now soulless doll covered in the blood of her two fingers that had been slaughtered using the finger slayer blade with the same mark of death used to kill Godwin. Of course, upon seeing this, you drop to one knee and beg the doll to marry you. Ronnie appears in spirit form and accepts your proposal, telling you that you'll be together when all is said and done before offering her wedding gift to you which is the Dark Moon Greatsword. Now to explore the Moonlight Altar a bit further, we find an Everjail containing Electo the Black Knife Ringleader. I used my recently acquired Moonlight Greatsword to full effect here, the Ash of War of which will charge the weapon with ice magic, making the heavy attack throw an ice projectile at your enemy. This made the Black Knife fight a lot more engaging than they had previously been for me as I could keep my distance from the frantic slashing moveset and wait till I had an opening to send a projectile. The standard backstab playstyle would have worked fine here, but I like getting to shake things up with a powerful new weapon. Electo changes up the Black Knife fight, 
by having access to a miniature version of the Destined Death ability on Malekith's weapon, activated on charged versions of the Jumping Slam. She also has a pretty fucking huge health bar, but upon her defeat, will reward you with the legendary Black Knife Teach Spirit Summons. Lastly in this area is a Rise, the puzzle of which will span nearly the entirety of the Moonlight Altar. Again, you have to seek three wise beasts, which will be spread throughout this massive area, but it is somewhat balanced in the turtles being massive themselves. They're roughly within these areas, and upon hitting the last one, you'll gain access to the Rise, where you'll be able to loot the spell Ronnie's Dark Moon. Now the last thing I'll have to wrap up content-wise within this episode is the fate of Ronnie's co-conspirators, the first of which is Blythe who manages to break free from his imprisonment within the Ever Jail and found his way back to Ronnie's Rise. You'll find him here after having slaughtered a handful of Black Knife assassins, with the madness of his shadow origins finally taking hold of him. He clearly only wishes to serve Ronnie, but her wishes leaning away from the will of the two fingers, his being is torn between ideals, finally breaking him. After fighting by his side time and time again, working with him through many trials and serving Ronnie together, he finally turns his blade against you in a pretty epic clash of frozen greatswords. We stand as the victor, having earned our rightful place at Ronnie's side, as he rages against the idea that he was torn from her and placed within the same confinement we once assaulted together. He fights both elegantly and savagely, weaving slashes together and slamming his weapon into the ground with frosty blasts, surprising you with new combos and abilities if you were expecting him to fight with the same moveset as the Baleful Shadow. He even features a double parry before falling into a critical, which can be quite engaging and reminds me of learning to parry the Bloodhounds. In the end, we put the raving half-wolf down and hopefully grant him some peace in doing so, before returning to EG to tell him what happened. EG wonders how Blythe could have possibly escaped the Everjay and laments how he regrets putting Blythe there in the first place. He tells us that he hopes Blythe will accept his apology the next time he sees him, as he expects to meet a similar fate soon enough. Reloading this area will prove him to be right, as he burns with the black flame effect of destined death with a dead Black Knife assassin nearby. You remain the sole survivor of Ronnie's conspiracy, each other falling along the way, which should leave you with some apprehension as to Ronnie's worthiness to be the Elden Queen. She failed to protect all of her loyal subjects, even despite claiming to love them. And I just love the perfect level of missing information we have on these characters. Uh, we have no way of knowing if following through with this path means sacrificing all of our friends just to plunge the world into the darkness of Ronnie's moon, or if her rule will be just and alleviating to all those who suffer in the land between. In many ways, the FromSoft style of ambiguous endings was a perfect match for George R. R. Martin's political fiction, resulting in storylines where potential monarchs let their closest allies sacrifice it all for a throne they may never sit upon. Like, imagine if I go through all of that just to finish the game on the frenzied flame ending. Wait, that literally happens on Game of Thrones, what the fuck? Anyway, let's wrap this up. Liernia the Lakes is such an interesting area of the game. Coming from the simple, basic, mostly melee-based enemies of Limgrave, Liernia complicates the game so dramatically. The magic side of Elden Ring is undeniably complex and fleshed out much further than previous titles, and it makes sense then to have a huge area of the game devoted to this magic as well as a massive ending-based NPC quest featuring the main magical families, histories, and goals, all tying into the main legacy dungeon of the area. Is this content good? It's complicated. The short answer is no. The gameplay absolutely suffers when the focus of enemy design is on magic. Telegraphs for magic attacks are notoriously annoying, and the tendency of design for these fights is to layer magic attacks alongside melee attacks, a practice that I find annoying, ranging from absurdly to ignorably so. And while I do find Liernia to be the weakest of the major areas in Elden Ring, I would be an absolute fool to simply boil it down to mage fights. Liernia is one of the most visually stunning areas that FromSoft has ever created. The majesty of these glintstone imbued structures and fantastical concepts are ever infected with morbid undertones and somber stories. Grand castles infested with hand creepers, picturesque swamps inhabited by wraith calling creatures, magical studies that cause glintstone to burst out of your head or incorporate your body into a graven mass. It's classic FromSoft, done on a larger scale than ever before, with better graphics than ever before. And that's not even mentioning the game's best minor dungeon, which takes place in Liernia and offers a unique experience compared to any other. There are highs and lows, but Liernia as a whole is far from the best content that Elden Ring has to offer. However, this conclusion comes with another notion, which this game stands alone in presenting to its players. Liernia consists of entirely optional content. 
Your experience through Lyurnia could involve galloping through towards the Grand Lift of Dectus, never to look back if you so choose, because Elden Ring is a game about adventure and exploration. And whether or not your adventure involves helping Rania along her ascent to the Elden Throne or disregard her existence at all, it's entirely up to you. And one thing I'd like to point out when it comes to the explorative ideas in Elden Ring is just how much freedom you're granted to play the game how you want, even from the early game. This is the second episode on a series that I expect to be at least seven episodes long, and we've already cleared two of the quests that feature Mending Rune endings. The second area of the game, we haven't even made it to Altus Plateau for all intents and purposes. We've already made it through Rani and Fia's questlines. Sure, the whole reason I was able to do that was through beating the double gargoyle fight, which I do criticize heavily. However, as I said earlier, you're also given just as much freedom to scour the map of resources to get pretty overpowered if you wish to do so. When I beat the gargoyles, it was with a plus six watchdog staff, which could have easily been a plus nine with a little more exploring and fully upgraded if I had progressed in Mogwin's palace. When I claim that Elden Ring is the greatest FromSoft game ever made, I'm not saying that everything is perfect and that every fight is as tight and well-designed as it possibly could be, because saying that about any FromSoft game would be fucking stupid. Even DS3, which is widely known as the Souls game with the best boss fights, has Deacons of the Deep, the Rotten Greatwood, High Lord Walnir, and Yorm, a lineup that should make you grimace. What I'm trying to say is that Elden Ring offers more for you to pick and choose from what you like from it in order to create a perfect playthrough for you. And while Lyurnia is probably my least favorite area, and I don't spend all that much time here, it's certainly many other people's favorite area in the game. If you're more interested in mage builds and NPC storylines and doll pussy than I am, then I'm sure it scores more highly with you than it does with me. As a whole, the section of the game I've covered within this episode puts behind us some of the worst content in the game, and I'm excited to say that it's all uphill from here. It was, however, a treat for me to once again play through this content that I would ordinarily skip in most playthroughs. With the exception of the Royal Revenant, I was happy to experience it all again. Or in the instance of Lower Einzel, for the first time. I'd like to thank you for joining me on the second installment of this series, and thank you for your patience. This has taken far longer to create than I expected, but I ended up covering far more content than I first assumed I would. Consider hitting subscribe and all that, especially if you're interested in what I have to say in the more important content I'll be covering next time regarding Radon and Moog. It should be exhausting for me, hopefully enjoyable for you. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and uh, hit me with a juice me gesture in the comment section. I liked seeing that last time, that was pretty funny.